Hello, listeners, and welcome to episode 85 of Push to Plat. That's right, it is the final episode for 2020. I'm putting the final touches on it today, the 30th of December, but I'm more than ready to kick this year across the finishing line, and I'm sure you are there with me as well. I'm sure you're ready to do the same. Let's hope that 2021 is a much more productive, fruitful, positive and enjoyable year than thus that we just experienced. On a personal note, it's been a wonderful year for the podcast. It has been so lovely to speak to so many passionate people from around the world. We've met so many new guests in the community. We've had so many returning as well, or look, even agreeing to return in to 2021. There are so many wonderful new guests still to be spoken to. Perhaps you are even one of them. Who knows? Who knows what the future holds for us all. I would like to take a moment, though, to thank all the guests that have been on this year. We are an incredibly unique podcast. It's me, the talking head and the guest. It is totally guest-driven. All our guests give up their time free of charge, and I hope that they have an enjoyable experience. So I'll take a moment now, if you'll join with me in thanking. You can give them a little a little golf clap, if you like, for their, their services to us, because they have entertained us, they've educated us, and more importantly, they've made us feel part of the community, a community that's not just me, it's all of us here working together, listening together, and spreading the word. So without further ado, I'd like to thank all our guests from 2020, including Olsero, Dragon Detritus, Resident Daryl, Boston George, Joe from GameSack, Lawless Llama, Gaz Davis, Kalai from GameStuff, Datwan Seagull, Cool Kid Joe, Platinum Zach from Platcast, Hakum, Sean Tigerus Line from Knuff Trophy Guides, Bliss, Nurse Feel Good, Dylan from Platcast, White Boys with Attitude, Florice, Levi, Chris Miller, Mick owner of Knopf's Guides, Eigen Space, Jonathan, Chris, and Minty from R3Cents, Aerith Flower Girl, I Yield to No One, Carlo Haas, Nameless 600, I Am Starling On Your Bro, Velvet, and The Overhyped Gamer. Whoa. It was a lot of conversations this year. Now, to explain this week's episode, it is a push to plat roundup. We did an indie one recently. It's a pretty meaty episode. You'll notice that by the timestamp when you when you load this thing up. My advice is take it in small chunks. I am taking a break now until probably around week three in January when we'll be back ready to kick off the new season with more wonderful guests. So piecemeal this out. Or look, if you can't, just over in in it. Look, I don't care. That is up to you. Basically, what we've got today is an overview of all the year's top sort of games. We've heard so much about Game of the Years already. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to take a look back at every month this year and pull out the sort of eight or ten real gems that I found or I intend to find. It's a lot of games here. We also have our wonderful Spam of the Year section as well is finally back and a kind of cheeky look at some of the most out there games of the year of which there were quite a few now it does it does kitch you like a wall of games in sections of this episode this week so what i've done for all our wonderful patreons every patreon all the games spoken of today in these sections are provided in the documents that i used in the patreon so if you want to make up a list of something you found interesting or potentially alarming to avoid then by all means jump on that patreon and do so Speaking of the patrons, I must thank you all so much. We've had we've had a core group that have been with us now since the beginning, and we've had a few that have come and gone, and it's been so wonderful, not only to financially assist this podcast, but also to show your commitment and to bring it to everybody each week. Through the Patreon funds this year, we've been able to acquire a video editing software in Filmora 9 so that I can play with YouTube. We've managed to also acquire an artist I owe full music and sound effects licensing which provides all the music that you hear in a legal manner throughout each week's episodes 
In addition to this, the Patreon funds have helped in all the hosting feeds, both on YouTube with our partners Repurpose.io and SoundCloud, our hosting service. It's not cheap to host a podcast by any stretch, and to get some assistance to do that so that we can continue to bring this show is a really wonderful thing. And I thank those people for stepping up, and I hope that the content that going forward is still to your your liking. And I'll take a moment now to thank you for the greater community at large. I don't want to come across as preachy, and so this is the only time I'll mention it this episode, but if you have a couple of dollars that you want to throw our way, it all makes a big, big difference. I won't actually tell you how much it costs per year to run this thing, but it's uh, it's sizable. So if you if you do want to chip away at it, I'd really appreciate it. And of course, there is plenty of content on the Patreon exclusive program as well. For Patreons, even though this show is stopping for a few weeks, there is still plenty of content coming. There'll be a few little extra mini episodes I believe and we're resuming the countdown of the top 60 but look you've heard enough of me today sit back enjoy the games sit back and enjoy the brief little mini episodes or vignettes if you like that have been submitted by members of the community some audio some read by me Because it is a longer episode, and I understand that not everyone may be interested in all the content for this episode exclusively, only once, you can find in the show notes timestamps for each of the sections. Look, just in case you're just bearing and you're white knuckling it and you want to get straight to the spam or hear your name in the platinum shout outs. What I'd like to start with today, though, is something that I really enjoyed the most in each and every episode with each guest. It's something that I strive for. It may sound that I just rock up here and just ask random questions of these people, but I put in some legwork because it's so important to me that not only do we have a good time, but they have a good time as well. By giving their time freely, it's almost an essential element, I feel. One of the greatest things that I like to hear in an episode is that they have enjoyed themselves at the end or that they are willing to come back. Of course, there's also some wonderful off-the-cuff moments that happened throughout the episodes. I've taken a brief excerpt of our guests as a thank you to all our greater guests for 2020. I hope you'll enjoy a little reminiscing as we embark on our Push to Plat roundup for 2020. Pull up a chair and relax. You sure as hell deserve it after this year. I'm wonderful and thank you so much for having me on. It really is a pleasure and I was bragging to the other uh, people of the Game Stuff podcast how I'm going to be on your on your show. The only number that really matters, 46,688 bronze. How are you this morning? <laughs> hello, hello. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I'm happy to be here again. <laughs> how are you today, Mr. Lama? Good, how are you? Look, I'm fantastic. And look, I have to get this out of the way. I love to say Lama Lama a lot so I may, I may do that <laughs> sometimes I that talk two of us Boston George number 155 Dragon Ball Z Kakarot that is uh, Boston George spam if you will <laughs> right. I'm not a completionist it's, it's sort of like my investment strategy I, I start I start off as a day trader and then it, it goes sour and I become a long term investor <laughs> so it's the same with games you know I try to do them quickly and then I can't finish them and then they take forever <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. I'm really, sort of, you know, love the podcast. Uh, you do a brilliant job of, of what you do. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm quite well. Quite a. I I clearly can tell that you you read that from the profile description on the site. <laughs> As I said, I do I do want to thank you. I'm hoping that I can extend this branch again in another six months when you've forgotten how painful this experience was, and uh, <laughs> no, and you've loaded up on some more children's games that I can ask you about. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> now, of course, you know, there's always a mistake somewhere in lists, you know, it's, it's inevitable, and, and of course here you stumbled on Doom Eternal. So, you know, now having, you know, played that game, I assume, how, how do you feel? Do you think that was a, a worthy inclusion at number two? Oh, oh yeah! Doom Eternal is the oh, best shooter I played this year, hands down. That game's uh, that game's fucking awesome. Really? Did you not like it? I look, look. I'm not a skilled gamer, Maka, but we're not here to talk ah, about this. It is a challenging it. game. <laughs> we we figured it out. <laughs> it's been fantastic. Um, thank you so much for reaching out. I've had, I've had a great time today. How are you today, sir? Oh, uh, massive. We have a wonderful guest today. A real see you next Tuesday sort of dude, if you ask me. Started to crawl with Atari, learned to walk with Nintendo. Now I run with PlayStation. That's wonderful, sir. That's wonderful. That's awesome. 
No problem at all. It's been a pleasure. It's, there's no point in hate playing something. It just doesn't facilitate the sort of, uh, you know, the mindset that you need. Because, uh, you know, if you're just calm and it's all good, it, it, things will happen. Good things will happen. You'll get stuff done, you know? Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, mate, yeah. <laughs> yeah um, the thing is... <laughs> the, <laughs> the pleasure's mine. I, I love being on the show, man. You, uh, you, you and Mindy both just have a good, a good thing going here. A lot of good positivity, and I like that... Oh yeah, and then my wife says she can't wait to be on the Excellent. show. Excellent. Well, well, I'm, I'm serious. We're well, definitely going to sort that out <laughs> later. That is. All right, I'll be the background character for that episode. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. It's it's been a wonderful experience, and don't worry, I'm not that scared of uh, coming back here. If you ever did invite me back, we don't need to touch Cyberpunk because everybody else and their dog has, of course, Maca. But uh, what I was oh, thinking... I do have something quick to say oh, about please. Cyberpunk. Yeah. All right, it's going to be very controversial. Get your fingers ready at the keyboard. I don't think Cyberpunk is going to be as good as everyone says it's going to be. Yeah, thank you thank you for having me. It was a blast, and uh, it was nice talking to you. Not a problem at all. It sounds like you've really done your research there. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I was just waiting for you to correct me as no, I went. You, good, you nailed good. it. You nailed it. <laughs> How is Knuff the dog today? He's fine, he's just he's napping, he's, he's snowing a lot, he's eating all his cookies. And yeah, he's, 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 he's doing he's doing great, actually. He's, he's getting a bit old, actually, but it's, it's just dogs, huh? they get old. And now I read, I, I sorry, we're dragging here, but I read he's 70 kilogram uh, mastiff, that's correct, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is, it that's, is. That's a big animal. The premise of this group is they formed in 2007. This is fantastic as well. After hearing the song Crank That Soldier Boy on the radio, as we know as console gamers, he was a major influence on gaming going on yeah, later on to make his own, own console. So I can't wait to get into that and then hear about the White Boys with Attitude console that we'll be releasing shortly, I'm sure, on the back of the big next-gen next gen announcement. But look, before we get there, enough from me. Let's hear from them. How are you guys today? Doing great. Uh, doing pretty through. good. Doing pretty good. This is going to well, be fun. I can already tell. Wow. Yeah, I'm doing good. Aussie, I knew you'd given me a good intro there for this episode. <laughs> yeah, thank you for having me. I'm wonderful, sir, and it's a pleasure to be on here. I've listened to your show for a good six or eight months, and I uh, really enjoy it. So it's it's a real pleasure to be on here with you. I don't need to acknowledge the bell. I'm not smashing ten plats. I was here. This is now. I'm breathing. You over there need to chill. Stop sprouting this nonsense, this lies, this vitriol. Trophies are not awesome. Life is awesome. Make sure your experiences are real. Not driven by the entry-level programmer and his sadistic pleasures. As he sets the hoops, get off your pogo stick. You're in control. Trophies don't matter. We have Jonathan Dunn joining us today. He's joined by his childhood friend, Chris Dow, and his adulthood friend, Minty Boo. How are you today, Chris, Jonathan, and Minty? Chris, you'll have to explain yourself because when you were on yeah. before, I let it slide. But you you, you also, you, you do some, <laughs> no pun intended, you do some dreadful things, sir. I mean, you skipped out <laughs> into the end. You, you, you've done these things that probably you used a turbo controller or some form of one or something. What is what is going on with your relationship <laughs> with the achievements? Well, okay. as, as you say, because you, you stalk my uh, PlayStation <laughs> profile. It's been a pleasure, CJ. Yeah, we got to do this for us. Sure thing, dude. It was an honor. Thanks for having me. Hey, you're welcome. Uh, I, I didn't I didn't know if I'd ever be here again because you stopped playing Rogue Galaxy in front of the band. <laughs> again, not quite game of the year, but <laughs> <laughs> still still recommended. Story. Well, yeah, look, we can agree to disagree, I suppose. <laughs> I'm, I'm oh, I'm sorry. Did I just? <laughs> no, no, I'm no, so no. sorry. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> It's been a, a great little friendship to develop, and I'm sure there'll be lots more, lots more to come. And there is a picture of little baby with a fist bump. <laughs> that is after getting a platinum trophy. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It was a big honor. I will uh, never forget you because it was my first. You, you were my first. Eh? <laughs> oh, abso- absolutely. You and your family and... The Push the Black community have a wonderful Christmas, however you spend it, and enjoy your new year.
So let us turn now to the Push to Plat Roundup for 2020. We recently covered the Indie Roundup with Velvet, but today we're going to focus more broadly on the main games that released this year. Now, I know you're thinking, there wasn't really that much that happened this year. Sure, the last month or two we had the big titles, but everything got delayed, everything got pushed. Well, One of the things that I love to do, and I know it probably sounds a bit absurd, is I love to get on the store, I love to see what's coming out, do a bit of reading, maybe watch some gameplay, but often just jump in and play the games. So I had the same reservations when I sat down to put the list together. I was like, there probably wasn't much for most of this year. I was pleasantly surprised, though, at just how many titles there were. Some of these I'd forgotten about, some I didn't even know about. So hopefully today we can bring to light some of these games throughout this year. Now, of course, it's not a definitive list of everything that released in 2020, and it is focused on the PlayStation and PlayStation 4. It would be lovely to incorporate PC, Switch, and Xbox, but for the brevity of time, we're just going to have to stick with the PlayStation. There have been some wonderful titles, including some Game of the Year nominations on other systems, which I urge you to seek out. Of course, almost every podcast under the sun is doing their Game of the Years or have been in the last few weeks. So I can rest assured in in the fact that you'll find that knowledge elsewhere. But what the point of this segment, I suppose, is, is to bring these games to light. Games that I've either played, I intend to play, or games that we should know about as a community. Now, I'm very conscious that just reading lists of games across months is going to be kind of boring. So I'm going to break it up, of course, with some of the listeners and also some of the future guests' own lists and favorite games of the year, of which we have a mixture of recordings that they've sent in that will drop in and readings as well. All of this will be itemized in a time stamps. We don't normally do time stamps on Push to Plat, but because of the, the heavy nature of the material of this episode, I've decided to put a few time stamps in. Now, we will also be dividing it up into the Push to Plat Roundup for the main games, the Push to Plat Spam of the Year. Finally, it's back, the Spam of the Year. And then an interesting category I stumbled across as I was putting it together, and it is the Push to Plat Most Out There Games of the Year. Because yes, there are games in 2020 which you just sit back, scratch your head, and go, what the fuck is going on? So look, without further ado, let's jump in. Now, as I said, there's going to be a lot of games come at you. For the Patreons of Push to Plat, I put together all this material in lists and it will be published on the Patreon for all Patreon members. So you can sit back. If there's anything that interests you, you'll be able to find it listed there. So let's jump into January. And for a January, surprising number of interesting titles releasing. Warhammer Quest 2, The End of Times. GOT7. Love Loop VR. Now, this could have been a category for the most out there games. You're probably thinking, what is this? I've never heard of it. It had no trophies. It was a VR experience. It was a Japanese boy band video clip. (laughs) Not the first one that we got this year. Or I should say, not the only one we got this year, but definitely the first one we got. Tokyo Dark Remembrance. It's a, a walking sim, point and click, highly narrative, incredibly dark, Highly recommended indie game. Darwin Project. So the Darwin Project, this was a futuristic battle royale that released to mm, maybe a little fanfare before pretty quickly dying. I'm not even sure that the trophies are still attainable in this one or the status of the servers, but I know a few of the community did jump into it. We then move on to Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. Kingdom Hearts Remind. So it took them years and years, 13 or something years for us to get the Kingdom Hearts 3. They followed fairly quickly within the year on the back with the DLC, but perhaps not the DLC we all were hoping or expecting. Very little story here. Basically, a, a quite an expensive boss rush mode that was added, although although quite difficult as well. Journey to the Savage Planet. So a game that definitely flew under the radar. A game that can be played in co-op and for the trophy list requires cop one of the most quirkiest games and perhaps the pick of january it's a beautiful cartoony bright art style it is a fetch quest style game it's not too long around the 10 to 15 hours for the platinum it's quite an enjoyable experience minding the fact that you do have a co-op partner 
Kentucky Route Zero TV edition dropped in January as well. Finally, after years and years, the final act, part five or act five, did drop. And we've talked about this game so many times on the podcast. It will feature on many Game of the Year lists if they are liberal enough to allow it as it released over years. It's an experience to be had if you like the walking sim point and click genre. It will expand your mind. And the final one for January, look, another Viet-esque of sorts, I suppose, Coffee Talk. It feels like it was so long ago, but the wonderful barista-inspired coffee art-designed visual novel. So then we move to February, The Dark Crystal Age of Resistance, a top-down strategy game. Look, not personally for me, but I understand it's a it's an acceptable quality. Zombie Army 4 Dead War really didn't do much for me, this game overall. Glass Masquerade 2 Illusions. Glass Masquerades, if you're familiar with it, was the Jigsaw game. Number two really, really pushed, I suppose, the amount of content in the game. Sure, the plat is a bit harder now because you have to do every puzzle on hard. Some of them kind of tricky and you can't use the hints that you could in the first one. Maybe moving this from spam game to a reasonably length platinum. Still a highly enjoyable and beautiful game within its own right. We will blessed with the Yakuza 3 and the Yakuza 5 remasters. February also saw some racing games. The Tony Stewart Sprint Car Racing was the first of two Tony Stewart games that dropped in 2020. Ironically, very similar games, if you like. In fact, some may argue that the NASCAR Heat series is literally just ripping the gameplay out from year to year. It's wonderful to see that they're now also doing this in the Sprint Car Racing track circuits as well. Darksiders Genesis came and flopped, according to many. Perhaps not one of the strongest THQ Nordic-inspired releases across 2020. Dreams from the Sony Media Molecule Studios, a game that took years and years and almost an unlimited budget by the sound of it to make, releasing in in like a pre-release, I suppose, without trophy for early adopters, but now with a full platinum. As to understand quite the grind, it's a game that I've never gone back to. I think most of the game that interests me was playing the smaller experiences or experiences people were creating, but I believe the trophies are based around more of the creation, some of the collectibles in a loose, I suppose you could say, story mode and then just the grind of perhaps playing some of these experiences. February also saw Vanquish and Bayonetta double pack. Who would have thought they would have come to the PS4? A real stealth drop. Hunt the Showdown Dragoon. Another wonderfully Nordic inspired walking sim. It's full of mystery. Think well, I don't know, what could you think this is like? Maybe Edith Finch a little bit, but but a little bit more established, if you like. Maybe a little rougher around the edges, but it has a ton of charm. Drugan, it's a game that definitely flew under the radar. House Flipper. Well, look, I know many, many of you played House Flipper. Another game that sort of came out of nowhere. It's a game that I have yet to get to. I know some of the themed houses, including the Breaking Bad house, was of particular interest to many, many people. And a double stack. Infliction from Caustic Reality drops in February. A horror game. Look, yes, it's a walking game. No real stealth requirements in this game. It plays like many horror games on a time loop. Published by Blowfish Studios, but a really exceptional piece. And I'm not saying that just because it's Australian, you know. I'm sort of Australian too. It's well worth your time if you like this genre. You're only looking at about a three to four hour experience. Perhaps less if you if you do indulge in a guide. Once you get into the loops of using the camera and how the time loops work and you get your head around it it's quite a nice experience for the trophies you possibly need a guide because many of the early collectibles happen in that first or two sections that that are us therefore missable but you know it's a short game and a double stack and the final big release for february i suppose we could say is two point hospital Anticipated by many in the sim genre, it turned out to live up to its name, incredibly grindy. While I did play a little bit of this, it was there was a lot going on in this one. It is, if you're thinking of these sort of management sims in the style of a lot of information to process, a lot of buttons to push, then this was the situation. For me, the UI was just a little bit too clunky with the controller as well. This probably a PC pick, but you know, if you like this category, I'm sure there was something of value here for you. 
March. So by March, we're really ramping up into the year with our big first fighting game release, the Grand Blue Fantasy Verse. It was localized for the West here, and it's a premise, I suppose, it was not only was it a fighting game, but it was also an RPG with a big selling point that you could play in co-op by inviting your friend into the game. The RPG mode, yeah, sure, it basically plays as half visual novel, half side-scrolling fighting stages, but that, that addition to to just a basic, I suppose, anime fighter was well welcomed. While I have no knowledge of the anime series Grand Blue, I did really enjoy the story. The artwork, most hand-drawn, was really beautiful. The online requirements for trophies are very minimal. There is an RNG base trophy, just depending on drops, of course, by playing in hard mode, you can sort that. The combo trophies, overall, not too difficult if you're skilled in in that sort of a style, a fighting, fighting style. Tom Clancy's The Division 2, Warlords of New York expansion. Obviously, we don't need to say anything about The Division 2. It was a massive improvement on the first one. All the content was sort of established early on in the game. It wasn't wasn't patched in as we were so familiar with The Division. It had a decent storyline, but look, you're you're not playing this for the story. You're playing to jump in with four mates and run the missions. That's what you could do. This DLC or expansion, which did release it at a hefty price, offered more more story missions. It's offered continued content in the form of seasons, manhunts, and challenges. I believe the price has probably substantially dropped now. If you like this game, this is definitely a worthy inclusion. Call of Duty Warzone drops. Hidden through time. It's a puzzle adventure, point and click. I suppose find-a-thon, if you like. A little bit like a, a Where's Wally. It's a beautiful sort of afternoon in style game. With a guide, it can be done in a couple of hours. Perhaps the grindiest part of the game is the online integration, where you have to do 50, I think it's 50, or it could even be 100 user maps. Obviously, there are many easy ones. But look, you can create your own map. You can have as much fun with this game as you as you wish so where would we be without a souls born and march sees the drop of neo 2 look too hard for me but you know i'm sure it's a wonderful a wonderful experience not to be done with the racing overpass an off-road racing game drops highly anticipated but perhaps not living up to its full potential or hype it's a game that uh, it's incredibly challenging in in ways so you are driving a four-wheel drive vehicle over very tough terrain some man-made some natural the tracks are quite long and unfortunately at time of release some of the trophies were very buggy if you can handle all that aside it is a unique game i feel that it does it does what dirt 5 tried to do in those off-road tracks in times dirt 5 is incredibly fun with these vertical wall scaling tracks but this game is basically all of that throughout and I think they did it really well if you do play this game you're in for a treat it has one of the thickest southern accents uh, of the presenter or narrator in the tutorial it's an incredibly long tutorial and you just it's just Hickville USA all through and through which is exactly what you want in this sort of off-road almost monster truck esh elements game Doom Eternal of course drops in March critically acclaimed shooter although kind of difficult Critically acclaimed JRPG makes it to the West. Persona 5 Royale. Hundreds of hours of entertainment if you like this style. Doggerai, the retro-style platformer with animal-like characters. Look, I am always interested in animal personification, and what what more could I want than a game called Doggerai? But look, I haven't touched it myself, so buyer beware. Twin Breakers, a sacred symbols adventure. So Colin Moriarty, not only does he own the podcasting game now, not only is he a valuable asset, obviously, to all gaming on the PlayStation, a staunch advocate of games, if not always Sony, and he's moved here into his first game with Chris and it's a it's a uh, brick breaker I suppose of sorts perhaps more of a story than many people were thinking perhaps not always saying as much as many people were hoping but the gameplay is solid and a lot of fun if uh, you know maybe a little challenging plat we turn our hands to VR in March with Paper Beast VR. It's an incredibly unique game. Again, not a hugely long game, around three to five hours. There are some miscellaneous and potentially frustrating style trophies in it, but, but a kind of calm and nice experience and double stack plat. Moons of Madness, a first-person story-driven horror and exploration of Mars drops. The first DLC, Control the Foundation, 
Creature in the Well. Now, this is a unique game. I've never played a, a top-down pinball-inspired dungeon crawler. If you haven't ever seen this game, you're probably like, what the fuck is that? Well, it's exactly as it sounds. You've got your flippers there. You've got your bouncers there. It's it's something that's truly unique. Now, whether, whether it has lasting appeal to see the whole way through or not, I'm not sure. But for the first hour or two, it's, it's something different and de- definitely worth a look. The Casebook of Arcady Smith and, of course, our Patreon producer, Zadol VP, going ahead and writing the guide. Look, there's no two ways about it. It's a janky game, but, you know, look, a fairly easy plat. Some of the stories are more fun than others, and there is one kind of frustrating mini game. Good luck with that. Operencia, The Stolen Sun, drops in March, a turn-based old-school RPG dungeon crawler. You can play this game in one of two ways. Now, when I say old-school, I mean like old-school's 90s. If you, if you are that sort, of a, that sort of a gamer that was around playing back then, if you liked your Baldur's Gate, if you liked these things, then perhaps this game is for you. It has a nice mix of modernisms within it, and the ability to return to all areas is a, is, is a very valuable throwback to old-style games. And the last one we have for March, the Complex FMV. It was a wonderful game, quite apropos for the current situation and the pandemic that we have ongoing. As we turn to April and the horror wheels start spinning with the Resident Evil 3 remake, wasn't that long ago we were all blown out of the water with Resident Evil 2, the graphical fidelity and beauty of the game. The tension is here, and for me, a little bit more of an enjoyable situation as you can move around. You're not confined in that police station, that oppressive police station of number two. Disaster Report for Summer Memories, a wonderful Japanese game. It is totally out there. What would happen in an earthquake situation? How would you survive? How would you deal with the fallout? Mm, Throw in a few human babies and maybe a giant adult bee. Final Fantasy VII Remake. This is a game that I've literally only picked up in the last few days, and I suppose I can't put down. It's not... Well, I suppose coming at it with no nostalgia for the series, having never played the original, I'm very much enjoying this. It's still not the exact type of Final Fantasy game that I want, that open world nature of 12, 14 or 15. But within its linear progression, it's really beautiful. The music is exceptional. Perhaps the best reworking of themes I've heard in all of gaming and overall, perhaps some of the best music I've heard this year. It's clever. It's funny. Yes, there's... There's decent depth to the emotional relationships, but it's a little bit too standoffish with Cloud for me. Having said that, the second half of the game really ramps up with Chapter 9's second half having one of the most memorable uh, experiences for me in gaming this year. Completely outrageous. Fallout 76, the Wasteland expansion. It adds the NPCs. Was it enough to save the game? Well, you be the judge. I've never been back to it myself, but look, it does in, it does intrigue me. Yeah, sure, it's janky. Sure, they pay you now to play it, basically. They've done some strange things offering service for hire in this game as it goes on, but the inclusion of the NPCs, sure, it makes it interesting to finally have a story in what was a very large open playground full of barrenness. MotoGP 2020, another solid addition to the MotoGP series, fast becoming the most respected racing game, definitely the most respected motorcycle racing game available today. Stranded Deep from the Queensland developer. Unfortunately, a game highly ambitious, but perhaps not always meeting its goals. It is a survival exploration game worthy of a look for a few dollars, but tread carefully where the trophies are involved. Another massive JRPG lands in April, Trials of Mana. Following straight on the heels is Deliver Us the Moon. It's an intriguing puzzler, walking sim, I suppose, with elements. It always feels a little off-settling as you you play in this apocalyptic near future. Predator Hunting Grounds drops in April. It's a co-op shooter, I suppose. It had the movie franchise. It had all the promises. It had all the problems that we saw in the Final Fantasy XIII servers. Incredibly long load times, slow matchmaking. Now, sure, it's probably been fixed since that initial launch. Hopefully, more maps have been added, and I know they've added more characters. It's a game to be played with other people, single players. Beware. 
Telling Lies, another wonderful FMV by Sam Barlow drops, different to perhaps many of the FMVs you play. This one is not just a passive sit back and choose some options. This one requires use of the search engine, much like her story, watching small clips uh, clips of the story in video format as you slowly piece it together. But what you come up with may not actually be the true ending of the story. When you do watch back that whole story, it's quite it's quite amazing to see, I suppose, the journey that you go on through your searches to get there. And of course, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a game without a wonderful mini game of solitaire added with a few trophies. Beware. Moving out drops the co-op co-op moving game i suppose by australian developer based in melbourne it's a it's an overcooked inspired game i suppose but this time furniture moving it does have some random controls but a wonderful assist mode that does enable the platinum to be somewhat easier but look even still you're not in for that easier ride while most of it is doable single player it's highly advised to have a second person if you're just looking for a fun silly co-op game then moving out could be just the thing for you Snowrunner. Off the back of Mudrunner, we now have Snowrunner. We heard about this game this year from some of the guests. It was highly, highly valued by them. But of course, these games, they do have they do have some jank and you need to have incredible patience. But if that reality, if the real life sim, sim element is important to you in games, then Snowrunner seems to have ticked many of those boxes for many of these people. April sees Sakura Wars. It was a game that was anticipated by me, and it's a game that I had a thoroughly great time playing. Sure, it's wonderfully Japanese. It's totally anime-inspired. It has fun... It has a fun sense about it and a silly Japanese sense of humor. Yes, it's a little, it's a little VNS heavy, I suppose, in its things. And it's all based around the developing and building of relationships and bonding stats. It has a frustrating mini game, the Koi Koi card game, but perhaps frustrating to us in the West as we don't know how it plays. The collectible system of bromides or cards, if you like, with wonderfully uh, exotic looking pictures of the uh, femme fatales throughout the game is a lovely inclusion it looks beautiful and while the the dungeon crawling aspects of the game do get very repetitive as the game goes on and perhaps a little boring as well overall it sells as a solid package the platinum perhaps another story as many of these dungeons have to be run multiple times with different characters as leads and s rankings Damien 1998, anticipated by many, and again, perhaps falling short for most. It's a Resident Evil-inspired game. I found the inventory system just a little bit too encumbersome to overcome, but again, perhaps my experience with these games. I'd be fascinated to hear what a Resident Evil sort of purist thought of this game. I think there's a lot of homage in here, and I think it's an encouraging effort, but whether it's worth the time and the frustration that some of the game will, will present with puzzles and as I said the inventory management system is really something for you the gamer to decide and the final drop for April Streets of Rage 4 it's a continuation of Sega's iconic arcade brawler series sort of dropped out of nowhere I've played a little bit of it sure it's button mashy but it's button mashy fun and the fact that you can play in co-op and it's a very stable in co-op really makes this game a fantastic experience As we slide into May, we have a little bit of something for everybody as we approach the middle of the year. For VN lovers, Arcade Spirits. For for free-to-play lovers, we even have Island Saver. What a fantastic and interesting, innovative idea from the National Westminster Bank. Sure, it's meant for kids. It's aimed at teaching them how to save, but, you know, there's some free trophies to be had. They did put out a little bit of Dino DLC. Yeah, for a few dollars as a kickback to the developers. But an interesting... Interesting experience that perhaps we will see more of into the future. Mafia 2 Definitive Edition bundled with Mafia 3 Definitive Edition hits the stores and I think it scared many, many people. Of course, many, many people also picking that game up 
for free through uh, <clears throat> discretionary measures in the Singapore <laughs> store. So perhaps for free, it's, it's allowable. It was very glitchy at launch. It has been patched. I did play it through. Obviously, it's not a remake. It's just a, a remaster, although that term may be a little loose. I never, never played the original. Sure, the graphics do look reminiscent of a PS3 game, but I found the gameplay loop to be very, very fun. And look, overall, I found the hard mode to be much easier than the original Mafia. If you're going to play Mafia, then you're definitely going to be playing Mafia 2. Golf with Friends, the wonderful solo or co-op based mini golf game, absurd in its whole design, challenging in its course design, and some wonderfully included mods that you can mix it up with goalkeepers, hoops, and even hockey elements within this game. It's not a bad game, and I know available uh, for free on Game Pass on the Xbox. So not all things hit well, and May sees the dropping of the longly anticipated crowdfund of the wonderful 101 remaster. Look, I think it overall it launched to much hype, but also hit with critical dismay. It's a game that many people enjoyed in the original form, but I don't know that it held true enough in its thing. If you never played the original like me, there's still plenty of fun to be had here, but there's a lot going on. It will be a very difficult platinum with many time trial requirements throughout the levels. Wonderful Origami Puzzler. It's not something we see every day. In fact, it's the first time I've seen it. A Fold Apart, a beautiful story between a teacher and an architect about long-distance relationships, career, and love. The mechanics within the game are cool, folding the screen in on itself. It does come with a hint feature, and of course, only 100% on the PlayStation, but still well worthy of your time. Maneater chomps its way into May. And look, what an experience. Yes, it's highly janky. Yes, there are glitches. Yes, the final boss fight can be very frustrating with the tracking in game. But if you can put all that aside, it's a hilarious experience coming in at 12 to 15 hours. Sure, some of the mechanics get a little bit tried and true as you go through. And you realize that in each zone, you'll be doing very similar things. But if you like the idea of chomping off legs, eating other fish, and becoming the this giant, almost mechanical shark with your artificial uh, modifications, then this is the game for you. Mortal Kombat 11 reaches its final form with the Aftermath DLC. Depending on how you can pick up this game, I know at launch it was a little bit of a piecemeal, especially with the Aftermath and perhaps not always respecting the base game buyers in the way that they sold it, but I believe now with the Ultimate Collection out, it is the way to play this game. Obviously, it's a tale of two sides. The story mode, I thought, was fantastic. Sure, it plays on this furthering this time you know, manipulation, I suppose, and time travel travel that Mortal Kombat 10 investigated. It's a it's a wonderful without spoiling it of course it's a wonderful play on the roles of the long established characters as well. And then of course you have your crypt, you have all your fighting that you're used to. As you'd expect it's a highly polished fighter and a reasonable platinum if you can handle the combo challenges. So June sees not a lot for us here. The wonderful puzzler quirky indie Evans Remains, the highly anticipated yet perhaps falling a little foul SpongeBob SquarePants battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated. Now, while that name is a mouthful, unfortunately the game can be summed up in one word boring. It really doesn't seem to offer any variety. Once you've played the first level, it's just more of the same. And I know a lot of these games, you're aimed at the younger audience or whatever. I'm sure if you have nostalgia, this game will push you on. But if you don't, it's a real grind fest and perhaps one to maybe skip. An interesting indie title, Indie Clips, drops through in June. And it's a, well, it's a mix of so many indie games. It's a homage, if you like. It has a wicked sense of humor. Sure, it has some janky controls, but coming in at a quite a reasonably priced game, it's a worthy, quick plat where you're going to get a laugh, even if you don't want to participate too closely in the story. And then the surprise for June would have to have been the Goosebumps Dead of Night. Look, it's a walking sim, but it's way more than that. Yeah, sure, it's short. Yeah, sure, it's overpriced, but it's more of a stealth game, and who would have expected that? It has a decent story throughout. It does look particularly well. It runs great. It has some wonderful sound design. I'd put this one in the list for a price drop.
So as we turn our hand to July, it's kind of amazing just how many games did come out, isn't it? I mean, how many of these did you play? I mean, how many of these games are we still going to try and play? It's no wonder the backlog continues to grow. July saw Marvel's Iron Man VR, F1 2020, another critically acclaimed F1 game. These games just seem to be increasing in quality. NASCAR Heat 5, perhaps as many would rightly say, it was a carbon copy of 4, which was a copy of 3 and 2. The biggest change in this series, I suppose, over the last couple is the is the removal of the track ratings making the overall trophy easier it also eases the the sim elements perhaps if you you know if you if you like the nascar this is really the only option but also if you like racing wheels i know the f1 is supposed to be fantastic with a wheel but this nascar game it's not bad especially if you have decent force feedback within your wheel you really can feel the grooves as the car hits the walls on the track sort out online alicization so there's been many of these games whether you like them or not comes down to a lot on how you can handle the ui in my my view i've always found the games enjoyable the ui is just clunky and evasive within the game and it really sets it to a b grade tier this particular sort out online alicization it really has evolved that system it's made the hud more approachable less evasive in the overall game experience sure the graphical fidelity switches between what you'd expect from an A, triple A game right down to like a, a B game, you know, where it dips and, and flows. But it does play very much, at least for the first three quarters of the game, very closely to the, the current story arc of the Alicization. I, uh, I'd recommend it if you're a fan of the series. I've had trouble getting to into any of them this far, having tried all of them pretty much. This is the only one that I've been able to get into. I like the gameplay. Yeah, sure, it's highly fetch questy. There are probably many better JRPGs uh, games to play. But, you know, if you, as I said, if you like the material, you're going to enjoy this game. Void T R L M colons dash two side dashes void terrarium what a name and it's a i mean it's just like the name it's a very hard game to explain it's a roguelike adventure set in an apocalyptic world as a robot. It has some wonderful crafting elements. Now, what I really like about this game is that I'm not a, I'm not a rogue-style player. I just hate dying and then restarting with nothing. But with this game, you're always increasing your, your equipment and your materials that, which you can use to further craft. Now, I never looked into the trophy system, but it does have a wonderful, wonderful soundtrack. It does play top-down, if you like. The map system is very very good. There is still weirdness within the Japanese-ness, particularly in the home hub world, if you like, that will take a little while to get used to. But if you go in with an open mind and you are looking for something that's completely different, then I would highly recommend Void Terrarium. It comes in at a reasonable price and there's enough difference here in the roguelike genre, even with (laughs) things like Hades dropping, the phenomenal Hades, as we all know, that it is still worth a look. July also brings what will be the game of the year for many people, Ghost of Tsushima, a wonderful realisation of Japan in the time of the samurai. Not only does it pay homage to the culture and the history, but it inserts enough fun gameplay that you never feel that you're being overwhelmed or bored by just continually doing the same fetch questy things. Having said that, it does lean on some of the mechanics, particularly the fox padding, a little bit to too much but that you know that's after the 50 or so 60 hours it's gonna take you to get there the combat system like many of these first party sony games is interesting there is depth there but ultimately it is a button mashing style of game but look i don't think you're playing this game for the combat well definitely not for the combat alone the the removal of a hud and the use of the wind to guide your directions all just increase the immersive nature of this wonderful highly recommended game to play. From one extreme to the next, we move to Rain Swept, a wonderful small budget indie title which shows us that you don't need millions and millions and millions and millions of Ghost of Shima money to make something amazing. The story is robust. It plays like an 80s detective noir sort of novel. It's just it's just wonderful in its creation. It's all focused on the dialogue. You're not here for the graphics. You're here for that loop. Yes, it plays like a walking sim. 
Yes, she can get the plat before the end in a few hours, but it's worth it's worth seeing to the end. It has just enough weirdness in there to remind you a little bit of Stephen King before he goes batshit crazy and introduces the aliens like he always does. Creeks, a game that perhaps many will not have seen it fly under the radar. Another indie release. It's very dark in its nature. It's a puzzler platformer, if you like. It has some interesting use of collectibles, which can lead to some frustration, and many light puzzles using the dark and the light. While it's perhaps nothing you know, completely new, it is very entertaining and doesn't overstay its length at five to six hours. Ty the Tasmanian Tiger (laughs) drops in July. Okay, look, I put this one here because it's Australian. I never played this game, and when I played it, it just shocked me that a game like this could have been made. The Australianisms, g'day, mate, are unbelievable in this game, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Whether it has any, any playability for people outside of Australia, I'm not too sure, and perhaps whether it has any replayability from people that played the original. I'm sure there's a nostalgia trip there. It does look good in a B-grade tier studio kind of way. I had no problems with jankiness. I found the controls to be good, and I think for a, a day or two, it's a wonderfully fun, if childlike, experience. July 28th brought the stealth release of Cuphead. No one expected it to come from Microsoft, and it caused many a concerned fan to wonder what Microsoft's relationship was with this studio, but they never owned them. They were just backing them, and it's wonderful that PlayStation gamers can see some of the wonderful titles that are on the X. Of course, by no means an easy feat, the hand-drawn animation in this game makes it for playing alone, even if you can only get past the first or second level. It has some wonderful music, but of course, if you're going for the plat legit, as we all know, there were methods found around the uh, the non-legit way, perhaps, then you're in for quite a challenging time. Not to be outdone, a remake, Destroy All Humans. I never played the original, but I played a couple of hours of this remake. It is gorgeous. It is absurd in the comedy and humor. I had no idea why this series was so beloved, but it's uh, it's well worthy of your time. The mechanics play very well. The shooting is very fluent. Made of Skur, the horror title by the FMV House from England. It's uh, we've look, we did a deep dive on it. What more can we say? It's not a genre that I play in very often, but it's a genre that it, well, a particular title that I enjoyed within the genre. Some wonderful sound design, and uh, you know, a little, a few scares, I suppose we could say as well. And rounding out July for the VN lovers, we had Buried Stars. It's an unusual VN in that you're uh, you're following directions. I suppose, more than, well, I don't know, how do we describe it? More more than you're, you're sort of used to. I suppose with VNs, we're used to picking uh, picking text options. This is, is a little bit more involved. Of course, the plat for this game is a little bit frustrating, perhaps for many, requiring multiple playthroughs. August sees the, the beginning of the free-to-play, well, I suppose free-to-play if you had PS Plus Rush with the Fall Guys Ultimate Knockout. For many, this game was a bane with certain trophies, but for others, it was a huge amount of fun. Just being able to stand on that finishing line and take people out as they were determined to try and cross was where real, genuine, childlike laughter could be had. Of course, never the point of the game. Thief Simulator drops through the darkest of times an interesting, but if low budget, horror-esque walking simulator romp. Zombie Driver Immortal Edition, again another stealth release. Who would have thought the promised PS4 version would ever happen? The remaster from PS3, and a nice addition, I believe, that if you own the PS3 version, you did get the PS4 version for free. The localization continues with Kandigawa Jet Girls, localized to the West and in English. Sure, this game is not for everyone. If you're not a Senran Kagura fan, then you're not in for this game. I can, I can assure you. Yes, it's girls on jet skis, scantily clothed. Yes, the jet skiing gets very repetitive, and it's not really challenging at all. But as with all of these games, it has an absurd story, which you could, I suppose, skip if you wanted to. But now that we can finally play it in English, why would you want to? The predominant faults, of course, of this game are the load times between sections. But, you know, you know, what do you expect in a racing game in 2020? Manifold Garden, one of the indie picks of the year, drops 
created by a physicist, an incredibly intelligent dude that also turns his hand to game making at times. And you do need to be intelligent to play this game. Your your understanding of spatial awareness is really put to the test in this game. I, I suffer from that area and I couldn't even really move past the first section. My understanding is though that if you can see these shapes in your head, if you can turn them, and that's basically what you're doing. You're a, you're an unseen figure, if you like, and you're you're entering these buildings and you can flip, walk on the walls and things like this. And you keep you keep distorting, I suppose, or flipping the direction you're in to make progress. It's uh it's very, very challenging, but also in a minimalistic art style, it's very beautiful. I wish I had the the uh, I don't know, ability, I suppose I should say, to to understand these games better. But if you do, then I highly recommend this for level design, if nothing else. Spirit Fairer, Mortal Shell, and Peaky Blinders Mastermind all drop through August as well. Peaky Blinders, it's an interesting one. Perhaps at a, at a decent sale price, I would highly recommend it. It's a stealth-based game that plays on a time loop. And it's a weird game because you can rewind time, keep your actions, and in the rewound time, use other characters, which is essential for things like opening doors, moving creates crates and setting up different elements within the environment it takes a little bit to get your head around but once you do the 10 chapters if you like or 10 sort of levels all playing in top-down perspective are very enjoyable it has cut well i suppose static cut scenes if you like uh, from the story that progressed the game as well i'm told if you're a fan of the series it's quite an enjoyable experience Platformer, well, childlike platformer, new Super Lucky's Tale makes its way across to the Xbox for the first time on PlayStation. Yes, it's janky, but it's a fun jankiness. It does have an incredibly difficult luck-based-ish trophy at the end in one of the mini games. But, you know, there are so many mini games in this game that by the time you get there, you may you may just be able to pull it out of the hat. I enjoyed this romp, but as I said, buyer beware with some of the trophies in the latter section of the game game. PGA Tour 2K21 drops and it's wonderful to see a decent golfing game back. It's been so long since we've had a high quality PGA Tour game, thinking even pre-Tiger Woods. Why were those games so good and yet the current offerings like the Rory McIlroy so poor? I know the Golf Club and the Golf Club 2 were highly acclaimed games within their own rights and it was wonderful to see these developers teaming up with 2K and an injection of 2K funds, one would assume, to make this game. It's the first game in a long time with an actually licensed roster of players and licensed courses. It had wonderful touches to the COVID with the flags maintaining in the holes and also the options to have no galleries. I really enjoyed my time with this. While not a hugely challenging plat and, you know, not even hugely long, it's a game that you're playing for replayability, not for the trophies. It has a wonderfully, uh, wonderfully diverse online community as well, which is borrowing from the golf club's model of games where you can enter different community events. Project Cars 3, well, a disappointment for me, but look, probably not a surprise for many. Unfortunately, this game was a drag almost the whole way through. There's so many issues with the progression, the money, and the experience all being tied up together in this game that it just it failed to deliver. I still don't understand how a game that, that's trying to borrow from elements of, of the Forza series, it couldn't, it couldn't do it better. Unfortunately, the DLC they've released uh, subsequently, I think they're up to two packs now, really doesn't hold any more promise for this game. It's a game that I might consider if it was a few dollars, but I would highly urge you to be careful. Even though it was patched throughout its uh, throughout its life cycle or early life cycle, there were still glitches, frame rate drops, and just, just random static at times that would replace your car on the grid. But ultimately, the, the progression system was unforgivable in what could have been a very interesting enjoyable idea uh, for this game. Descenders. Well, you know, that, could, that you're probably like, what is Descenders? Well, Descenders, the extreme downhill free riding sim mountain bike game. I don't know. I've never played one before. Well, I played one on Xbox, but never one that was procedurally generated. It's actually not as hard as you think. I played uh, recently a little bit of the Lonely Mountains, which is, you know, a little bit more cartoony in its style. That can be very challenging on the controls. This is a bit more approachable. It's a bit more, I suppose, of a realistic 
uh, sim, if you like, with, with dulled down elements. But of course, if you want to make it challenging, you sure can in those settings. It also has wonderful integration with online play. August must mean the dropping of more sports games, and of course Madden NFL 21 doesn't disappoint. Claimed by many as a step backwards in the franchise, the removal of the story mode was also the removal of my interest in this title. No Straight Roads by a Malaysian developer. It's wonderful to see a Malaysian game. They're very thin on the ground. It's uh, We've talked about it before on the show. It's an interesting rhythm game. It has some wonderful elements in it, a kind of a quirky story or whatever else, but also some fatal flaws. It was a, it was a big stretch for this studio, and they, they didn't, they didn't back away from it, which I like. They were really, really shooting for the stars. And while they perhaps didn't always meet that, they have landed comfortably comfortably on the ground. It's a game that I recommend playing, but perhaps for the Platinum, beware. Control, the second expansion drops. Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles. Again, highly anticipated, but uh, I heard that it didn't have a plat, and I think we saw the community react. Nexamon Extinction, the Pokemon ripoff game, arrives, and Wasteland 3, for many, another critically acclaimed game of the year, drops. As we move into September, another free-to-play massive game, Spellbreak, drops. An open arena-style game with an incredible amount of depth for a free-to-play and still being supported today. The game looks like it may have some life yet to come. Tony Stewart's All-American Racing, as we alluded to, the second Tony Stewart game, pretty much a carbon copy of the first releasing earlier in the year. NBA 2K21 is back. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 Plus 2 drops to much fanfare and critical acclaim as the nostalgia trip for this one is real. WRC 9 FIA World Rally Championship drops. And yes, many people I know have been burnt with these games in the past, but this is the most solid uh, well, rally game that you can play. It's really the only option, I suppose, where I suppose you could consider the Dirt 2.0. Still still valid. Still valid for sure. The wonderful thing about this game is the real leaning in on the simulation and the off-road racing part of the schedules. You now have full control of the team and the game garage yes all the rallies are still there but this this addition of the calendar which has been present in the game before but having more choice on what you do on the off days it really adds to a substantial package i'm really looking forward to playing the up resed enhanced version on the new xbox i also understand on the ps5 it's one of these games that packaged for free from the ps4 to ps5 upgrade Another throwback with THQ Nordic. They own everything and they're starting to push stuff up with the Kingdoms of Avalar re-reckoning. The Suicide of Rachel Foster drops. It's a wonderful, a wonderful walking sim with horror elements, although it's not a horror game. It's well worthy of the three to four hours it will take. Inertial Drift Drops, it's a punk-inspired art design that uh, is kind of more difficult than you would assume in this game. It's a, a racing game drifting by nature with VN story elements, but believe me, if you're going for that plat, your work will be cut out for you. Not all roses in September as the Crisis Remastered game drops, perhaps one of the worst from a major studio. This game, unforgivable on release. I'm not sure if it's been improved. Graphic drops, frame rate disgrace, and uh, and just not a fun experience at all. But I, I do hope that game has been fixed into the, the present day. Another massive release, perhaps many, many uh, gamers of the Western or the Eastern, I should say, Persuasions Game of the Year, 13 Sentinels Agus Rim. I have it sitting here. I can't wait. This will be my next game after Final Fantasy VII. It's a VN-esque style Japanese story, an amazing story with drones and mechs in combat. What, what more could you want? Big Bobby Car, the big race. Look, you've got to have a kid's game in there. Well, look, a kid's game that's going to be played by many an adult too, I suppose. It handled well. It left a smile on my face. There was nothing challenging in it. But for a, a licensed product and, you know, Big Bobby, it's a car. It's a, it's a real thing from Germany there. It's, it's kind of good. You know, we've seen some pretty dicey things uh, in this, this playing field. But to see one like this, this is, this is no race with Ryan. This was a fun four to six hours experience. 
Mafia definitive drops, uh, I think, to a little bit of caution this time around after the Mafia 2 remaster, but there didn't need to be. It looks beautiful. I played this on the, the base Xbox. It was stunning, to be honest with you. What a game. I'd never played it before. I was sucked into the story and played it over a couple of days non-stop. I understand that hard mode is kind of challenging with that race, but look, if you're not here for the trophies, knock it down a bit and just enjoy the movie-style gameplay. And then our final one for September. Look, I don't think it, it was very big in our community, again, because it only had 100%, but massive in the general gaming community. Genshin Impact. It's a game that really, really interests me, but who has a spare 100 hours to spare? And if you do, why not put it into a Final Fantasy game? October sees us pushing ever closer to the big AAA launches of the year. We start with Crash Bandicoot 4, It's About Time, the brutal platformer with its time trials. Star Wars Squadrons, the predominantly online multiplayer Star Wars game from EA. Ride 4, look, they are persisting. The games are getting better. Perhaps the fullest of content, this game was not an easy racing game by any stretch, with far more in Inclusion of real life, or I should say full length racing. Quite a challenging plat with plenty of DLC to come. Nickelodeon Kart Races 2, the Grand Prix comes. I haven't played this myself, but I hear that it's very, very similar to the first one and just as grindy. Of course, if you are going into this one, I'm sure the nostalgia trip will be real. But the the inclusion of having to play all three cups at all three different levels, that's a lot of racing. It's just a bit of a turnoff for me. Neighbours Back From Hell drops the classic puzzle game. I Can Fall, the turn-based tactic RPG about a group of troublesome magic students. It is free on the Game Pass. I haven't got to it myself yet, but I hear wonderful things about this game. Coming in around 15 hours, it seems like a perfect version if we didn't have so many other games to play. Why don't we check market for 2021? Who would have thought a G.I. Joe game would drop out with Operation Blackout? NHL 21 and the critically acclaimed Monster Prom XXL comes to console. A uniquely disturbing visual novel dating simulator where all the characters are some version of monsters and the dialogue is absurd. Raji and Ancient Epic... So this was an unusual one. This came out of nowhere. It is a platformer with, uh, I suppose, some button mashing combat throughout. It's a wonderful look at Indian mysticism, I suppose. It's very beautiful. It plays in a top-down style. There's plenty of depth here in the upgrade system and also in the combat system that elevates from just your standard button masher. While not overall long in length, it's actually quite a beautiful game and worthy of a look if you have a spare day or two. It's quite an interesting journey. Ghost of Tsushima drops its Legends free DLC, but let's be honest, it's really almost an expansion pack they could have charged us for. Yes, a lot of it's reliant on co-op play, but there's even got some story mode in there as well. The game, it just keeps getting better. Monster Truck Championship well, it's tough to get a decent monster truck game. It's been it's been some time since the old Monster Jam games that they've managed to achieve it. This walks a fine balance. There are some really encouraging elements here. The trucks finally actually feel like trucks. If you tap to the left or right, you're not going to see reactions. The, the controls do feel heavy, and once the truck starts moving to the direction, it's really hard to stop it. So I really do appreciate the feel. Obviously, that makes this game a little more challenging than the others. The career mode, though, still lacks much interest. It's now divided rather than just continually monotonous races like we saw in the Monster Truck release last year. It is divided into events that can can have anything from figure of eight racetracks to drag strip sort of circuit racing to destruction as well. But again, they get a little bit tired as you as you move on. But it's a moving in a direction that at least that I'm I'm more enjoying. Amnesia Rebirth. Well, look, if you want the shit scared out of you, this is the game. Whispers, wonderful sound design, screams and bumps in the night. It's a game to be played with headphones. 
Asterix and Obelix XXL Roman Astrid. I'm sure this one flew under the radar for many, many people, but it is worthy of a look. We've had a few of the Asterix and Obelix games over the last few years. This is the first one, though, that really plays homage to the original game. Yes, the, the controllers can be a little bit janky in this Roman Astrid, if you like, but one of the coolest things you can do is you can play it in the original graphics mode or the up Roman Astrid mode. And it's done as fluently as just tapping the L2 button. One of the great things is that they actually incorporate it within the game. Some of the challenges in the, the collect coin challenges within the time limit, you actually have to switch between both modes within the challenge to be able to see the coins. So I really like how they've lent into that. I've never seen that done in a remastering before. And I, I think there's I think there's some validity to that in the future. The Legends of Heroes Trials of Cold Steel 4 drops to a much anticipation, another massive JRPG. The Dark Pictures are back with little hope. For many people, well, I don't know, for me, I should say, perhaps the more enjoyable experience. Sure, there were a lot of jump scares, repetitive jump scares, perhaps, through this, but it really, it just goes to show how solid this series is. And for someone that is following, well, it's not an episodic release, but following a yearly release of a of a story in a larger world. I think it's I think it's very entertaining and it's it's a game that you really need to have played the first one to to feel the mechanics as they travel through to this second one. Many quality of life improvements. And our final one for October here. Well, oh, right at the end of October, I believe too was Visage. It's another game that's flown under the radar, probably the scariest game in 2020 hands down. A PT inspired walking sim with some brutal brutally difficult puzzles an insanity system not dissimilar to amnesia and just a dark terrifying feel with oppressive sound design while this game may prove in parts very frustrating if you're a horror fan this is a must check out as we shuffle into November, we start to see the first of the next-gen console games. Uh, many of these games crossovers, though, which really it really begs the question of how wonderful games will be in the next year or two once they are finally made solely for these new systems. We start with Dirt 5. I've talked about this game before. While a little disappointing for me, it is incredibly fun, I suppose, if you like arcade racing. It's bright, it's beautiful. The weather in the game, especially on the next-gen consoles, looks fantastic. You feel the rain. You can see the mud slicks as you drive through it. I found that all the cars pretty much handle the same. Maybe the tractor is a little different. I thought the inclusion of, a, of these off-road events was fun, although I think there wasn't really enough in them in what is predominantly a four style of racing uh, events that just keep cycling through. And an interesting idea of throwing a podcast in to create some sort of a narration for the story, but ultimately perhaps playing with the sound off is the best solution. Then we drop into all the console release games, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Fuser by Harmonix, their next music rhythm, or DJ Sim, I suppose, game. Planet Coaster, the console edition, finally making it to the console. Yakuza Like a Dragon, Sakuna of Rice and Ruin, a game that I've just recently picked up. Highly looking forward to it. It's actually a side-scrolling platformer with uh, one was sort of 50% of the game and the other half is all about a rice simulation and rice growing. It plays, I'm told, a little bit like a roguelike in elements as well. So I look forward to, to bringing more of this game to us in 2021. Perhaps a, a sleeper hit. Sackboy is back with his big adventure. Marvel, Spider-Man, Miles Morales, Just Dance 2021, of course. The Pathless, another wonderful indie cross-gen game for Sony exclusive only. Call of Duty, Black Ops, Cold War, and Kingdom Hearts, Melody of Memory. A game that's been anticipated. It was uh, news of this game, I suppose, coming out right at, at the beginning of the year. Perhaps it's... Uh, well, look, I was going to say there's not a lot of depth here for people that don't 
don't like the series, but it does a wonderful job of telling the story of all the games. You sort of play two worlds, if you like, usually of one to two songs, and then you get, you know, these lovely cut scenes with narration. I thought perhaps this was the first time I would get to understand the Kingdom Hearts story, but after about the uh, the third or fifth world or so, it was getting so convoluted already that I just sit back and looked at the, the bright, shiny pictures. Yeah, it's fun. Whether it's a, a wonderful rhythm game or not is, you know, subjective, I suppose. If you, if you have nostalgia for the songs, again, you'll like it. There is plenty of replay ability, which is lucky because the trophy list will require you to play all songs three times. And like many rhythm games, there will be an element of learning a couple of the songs very well, almost from memory, to beat those full chain requirements on the proud difficulty. The last ones for November, the FMV Five Dates, a wonderful look at isolation for singles in Britain. The Death Come True from the creator of the Dangan Romper series, also in FMV form, and Katamari Damasi Reroll, another fan favourite full of nostalgia. So that brings us to the final month of 2020, December. I told you there was a stack of games. We start with Worms Rumble, of course, the PS Plus offering. It's a Battle Royale style of Worms game. Who would have thought? Twin Mirror, Don't Nod, well, a smaller team of Don't Nod's current release. Yes, it's a little bit janky. Yes, it's not what we've come to expect with Life is Strange, but I'm told the music is wonderful and the story well worth playing. It's on my early list for 2021. Immortals Phoenix Rising. Who would have thought two Assassin's Creed-esque inspired games releasing in basically a week of each other from Ubisoft would be a be a smart move? This game is, I don't want to say it's Assassin's Creed light, but when we look at how big Valhalla is, then I think that's a, a fair statement. It uses much of the same gear leveling as we see in the Assassin's game, but it has a much greater emphasis on exploration. It doesn't mark everything on the map. A bigger emphasis on puzzle solving as well and some wonderfully offbeat humor as we get a narration from Prometheus and Zeus. An RPG that I haven't had a chance to try, Haven, becomes critically recommended free on the Xbox Game Pass. Dragon's Quest 11s, needing no introduction, of course, Echoes of an Elusive Age, the definitive edition. Just what you need with your Dragon's Quest, even more content. Summer in Mara. This is an interesting one that, again, will probably fly under the radar wedge between such huge games and the end of the year. It's a farming simulator-style fetch quest game. Yes, it's highly cartoony in its graphics and you know very fetch questy in its quest, but it's a wonderful no-brainer or podcast game if you like those things. And if you do like that light farming element, sim elements, it's worth a look. Shady Part of Me, basically the, the the sequel, if you like, although not related, to Contrast. It's a wonderful color, light and dark puzzler game with shadows. It tells a nice story, which I've actually realized is, is, a, is also dictated by how you play this game. It feels like a co-op game, but you play as one person dividing the sticks on the controller. Well worthy of your time. Some beautiful music throughout as well. Cyberpunk 2077 drops and look what more can we say that hasn't already been said and then to see us out this year MXGP 2020 the official motocross video game by all reports playing exactly the same as all motocross games to this point which is a little disappointing there's been no evolution and then finally, the wonderfully dark Goiter, which plays as a, well, a bit of a horror point and click, if you like. I still haven't had time to go in. It features on my list in 2021. So there you go, listeners. That's a massive wall of games. Who would have thought there was so much there to play in 2020? There's some real gems there, no matter what you play. And I hope that inspires you to, to you know, increase your backlog even further into 2021. We're going to take a short break now, and then we'll be back with a few more of the submitted favorite games lists of 2020 before we hit the beloved spam of the year. Gaz Davis, UK listener, member of the Push to Platinum. 
community and former guest. He was on in episode 50, It's Not Soccer, It's Football, and he submitted his top 10 favourite games of 2020 and he's ranked them. Of course, if you wanted to hear Gaz in episode 50, it was a, it was a wonderful conversation. We covered all the usual games and things, but then we took a bit of a dive into what it's like trying to talk games in, in real life, you know, outside of these online communities, which we all gravitate towards, and how difficult it can be to find these people to talk. You know, we're, we're all hardcore gamers, and, and there is still, there's still very much a stigma, I think. Like, you know, look, I don't, I don't play my Switch in public still. I still feel a stigma associated, which is stupid, considering how many, many people play. But I know it's a, it's a, common, it's a common thing that many of us have or whatever, and that's why we like these online communities. So we sort of, we talk about that. It was a really interesting conversation from a very grounded family man and I, I really enjoyed that and I, look I'd, I'd throw it out there for, for your consideration to jump back and listen to in January if you're if you're if you're looking for something to fill your time a very worthwhile conversation so he starts us off here with his 10th favorite game of 2020 dead to right retribution look so I've never played this game so I'm going to take your word for it there number nine need for speed most wanted Look, this is a wonderful throwback to the PS3. This this is a massive, it's a massive game. Back when Need for Speed, or well, many would say perhaps Need for Speed had hit their, their forte, the best games being the earlier games. All I remember of this game is the copious amounts of DLC and the fact that the DLC pass would never go on sale. Now, I'm sure now in today in 2020 it does, but a few years ago I remember watching it like a hawk, but it never did of course, there were so many licenses in the, those DLCs to acquire, doing just random, you know, sort of almost like mini game esque things, I suppose, within the overall game. And I'll never forget lining up with 13 other dudes in a party chat. Well, it was sort of a back then, I don't even know you could have 13. So it was a messages and people playing on multiple systems and all this lined up so you could jump. I think it was 13, maybe it was eight, to jump over all these people to unlock. It wasn't even a trophy, shock horror. It was just a license plate that went over all. Look, I never finished it, Gaz, but I'm sure you did. I love a racing game and I, I echo your, your recommendation here as your number nine need for speed, most wanted. Number eight is Astro's Playroom. This is the recent release for the PS5 free-to-play game. Many on the PS5, many people I know start with this as their first platinum. I haven't had the chance to play it, but everything I see about it and I hear about it, it's a wonderful nostalgia trip. And is there a better way to start your journey into this next gen than Astro's Playroom? Look, I'm still to see it, (laughs) literally. Drive Club Bikes is his number seventh game. It's a wonderful inclusion, so I know you'll love your racing games. And this is, uh, I'm glad you went with this one. We all think of Drive Club, you know, the, the tragic uh, Evolution Studios, the story there being shuttered or whatever else, and the online being disabled. But this game, it's, it was a spin off, I suppose. Same engine, same mechanics coming out. Look, I'm not even sure how long. I, I want to say six months, but maybe it was a year, who knows, or whatever. The mechanics, of course, all the same, the events in the same style, but on bikes. And it was just. It was another wonderful addition with all those DLC tracks. It's such a shame, and and I don't know if this one, the the DLC online, I know there was an online trophy in the plat. I assume the online is still up there. It's probably worth checking if that concerns you, but it was such a shame that the base game no longer is because I remember doing that game, you know, pretty close to when it came out or whatever else. And yes, it was buggy. Yes, it was it was you know, interesting or whatever, but it was a it was a very much an arcadey style racer at that point. And I know, I know it's still still predominantly is and, and smashed through the platter, whatever, had the grind for the distance or whatever it was back then, the, the leveling up and stuff like that. And then, of course, so much DLC proceeded, just packs and packs of DLC. And, of course, in the, the Drive Club base game, the DLC got pretty tough there. Some of those Ferrari challenges in, in, in the weather as well, absolutely crazy. You couldn't see anything. When Drive Club bikes came out, I, I had a feeling there was going to be the DLC, and being able to pace that plat across some of the DLC was wonderful. In many ways, that game, I think, you know, Milestone has a lot to thank for that game, ironically, <laughs> down the track with Evolution, I suppose, but it really set up this this continued support for racing games in the form of DLC trophies, and of course we see that, you know, being adopted in Ride 3 and then into the new release in Ride 4. His sixth favourite game of 2020. Look, 
<laughs> I don't know. Look, you probably liked it, sir, because it is, uh, it's fun to play. I mean, that's the point of it or whatever else. Of course, the free-to-play, uh, if you had PS Plus, otherwise uh, not free-to-play, uh, Devolver Digital published game, Fall Guys. It's a, I mean, it's a remarkable game if you consider this studio's, it's the first, uh, first major sort of release for this studio. Sure, it, it released with issues and we've had guests talk about in the past how whether, you know, that is or isn't acceptable, but it, you know, it's a feel good story for them or whatever else in, in a year where these free to play games have been massive, you know, or I suppose not even necessarily free to play, but these, you know, big, you know, online games like Among Us, if you like Genshin Impact as well. It was wonderful to see Fall Guys having its place as well and having its place on a Sony uh, PlayStation console. Of course, you know, there is the infamous trophy there of winning five in a row. But, you know, look, if you can do that, good luck to you. I, I tip my hat. That is that is too much for me. But, look, even if you're just there to troll people, it is perhaps one of the most fun games to stand towards the end and just try and rush tackle and grab people. Obviously, that's not the point of the game. But look, you know, it's one of the things that I enjoyed most of it. Number five for Gaz is Watch Dogs, the original Watch Dogs, Aiden Pierce. What a, what a wonderful game. Again, you know, critically, I don't know, critically a mixed bag, I suppose, for this game. But look, I really enjoyed this game. Of course, the infamous drinking trophies. Look, I heard all sorts of stories about these trophies, about how you could play them, you know, looking into the mirror or whatever to reverse the controls because they're so intentionally wonkatated. Never a big fan of these, you know, bad controls to make a, you know, joke to make a fun experience like a surgeon simulator. I am bred. Look, I understand there's a lot of skill in controlling the jank, but that that mini game, look, I enjoyed it. I could never get to the last one, but you know, more power to the people that did. Of course, it also had that dreadful song sneak app trophy, I believe, where you had to just randomly uh, hope to find all the songs as well. But, you know, on that side, well, away from that side, I suppose, I, I really enjoyed the story. I know, you know, it is it is whatever for many people, but look, I really enjoyed it. It had some substantial DLC as well. And if you consider how far Ubisoft have come in that franchise, Watch Dogs 2, which, look, admittedly, I, I didn't really play or whatever, and then to Legions. Again, you know, perhaps maybe not everyone's favourite game, but that series has evolved so far, and in many ways it stayed true to its original form. I think in Legions now, being able to play any character, it just, you know, and, and the hacking and everything being so much more seamless, I think it's a wonderful thing. And, of course, I see that I believe it's Blood... I'm not sure what it's called. The the new expansion or the first major expansion for Legions will, of course, include the Aiden uh, storyline. It's wonderful to see. He goes for a classic here for number three, Infamous Second Son. It's a great game, isn't it, Gaz? It's one of the first games I played uh, on the PlayStation, I suppose, in this when I started back in gaming and, and trophy hunting. And I, I don't know, just having that option, you know, it seems silly now, hundreds of well, thousands of games later, I suppose. but Having that option to have two divergent paths in the way that you play the game uh, based on your actions or whatever. And you look, admittedly, you know, I may never have done the other playthrough for that, but to have that choice was wonderful. And, and for me, that was such, a, was such a great first experience. And I was lucky enough to come at it at a time where First Light uh, was out as well. Obviously, a much smaller experience. And I, I, think I, I think I enjoyed that even more because of its, its bite-sized nature. But it's kind of amazing to think it wasn't that long ago that game came out and how far how far we have moved. His second favorite game for this year, Spider-Man. Well, look, what can you say? For me, this was the best of the two Spider-Men, but playing on PS4, perhaps you know, with PS5 and the uppers, it would be different. But it was a wonderful game, wasn't it? I mean, just the swinging through the city just the 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 storyline that was succinct in that you know you didn't you didn't need to gate it it wasn't it wasn't like you had to do all these side quests to move it forward yeah sure there were a ton of crimes a load a load of crimes if you wanted the platinum perhaps some would say too many but the overall experience was wonderful and i'm not a comic book guy i don't know i don't know if you are gaz but it, it's one of the the problems i've had with many of the batman games is i don't know the story you know i don't know what's going on or whatever else but the, the backstory, but to be able to just jump into this game and, and it was all sort of there and look, I'm gushing, I suppose, but a worthy, a worthy experience, of course. And look, brings great joy for me to see that your number one game that you played this year in 2020 was the wonderful Remedies Control. Look, I think it's a must play game. I mean, the only reason you wouldn't play this game is if you were sitting on the fence waiting for this ray tracing or other 
other ungodly things that are going to be added in the next gen or whatever if you if you play on the PC already. But it's a it's a really special game. Sure, it's not without its frustrations. The map is is a challenge, and you know, in this Metroidvania like I suppose game, it's a once you get into it though, it's just so immersive. The sound design is phenomenal. The graphics, even without all this fancy bling, you know, is still it's still amazing, and it's not an easy game either. I mean, there's fights uh, towards the end of Mr. Tomasi. They're, uh, they're not easy at all. And yes, sure, there's a cheese method, method where you can run with your balls between your legs up to the ceiling and pray to survive. But, you know, if you're going to stand there and legit take it like a gamer, it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough game to play as well. Of course, two wonderful expansions, Gaz, which I'm looking forward to getting into. I'm sure you are as well. Thank you so much, sir, for your support this year of the show and for listening. I really appreciate it. I really appreciated our conversation earlier in the year. And thank you so much for submitting your top 10 favorite games of 2020. What's up, CJ? It's Resident Daryl, and with me today I have the Ellisaur Trio. I have Spider Packs, Zoe Butterfly, and Noah the Builder. So, Spider Packs, what is your favorite game of all time? Fortnite. And why is that? Because it's a fighting game. It's a fighting game? Yeah. It's a shooting, it's a third person shooter. It's, it's a, a shooter it's a battle and, royale. A, and, and a fight. And what else do you like about it? Um, that you could to choose your character. You get to choose your character. You like all the different skins? Uh-huh. They have good skins. What else do you like about it? Um. <laughs> um. That there's a lot of cool gliders and pickaxes. What about dances and emotes? Yeah, say so. I just got that today. Awesome. All That's right. all. All right, Zoe Butterfly, what is your favorite game of all time? A hundred percent Roblox. And why is that? Because Roblox is one game with more than a thousand inside of it. My favorite game in Adopt Me is probably, I mean, Roblox is probably Adopt Me just because it's really fun and stuff. It's really fun. Because you can collect all these pets and you can trade them and it's, you can role play in that game. It's just really fun. And then in Roblox, there's legitimate, like legitimately every game you can wish for. Think Fortnite. If you type in Fortnite in the search for bar and there comes up like four different Fortnites. You search up like like Fashion Famous because that's actually a game on there that I really like. There's like Fashion Famous One, there's Fashion Famous Two, and there's like a bunch of remixes of it. It's like a super fun game. I don't know why someone wouldn't like it. Awesome, awesome. All right. Know the Builder. What is your favorite game of all time? Um. Well, right now it's Horizon Zero Dawn. Um, mainly because it's got a very interesting story and there's a lot of side missions that you can do. And in those side missions, you can earn special abilities that boost your spear attacks and other stuff. So, like, this one mission, I went and had to help this woman, uh, this, this man, actually, who broke his leg, who was searching for his child because she was going after her mother's spear, the last thing that, ha- that she did before she had passed away. So you had to go help her, and once you got the spear back, it gave you a plus damage boost on your spear. So, um, really neat, and then you also go to these, like, cores where you can learn to override special machines, and they have all types of machines. They have made-up machines, they have dinosaurs, they have saber-tooths, they even have, like, falcons and stuff. Um, another thing is, the, the story's really well, because you also go on bandit camps, and you hunt, you don't really, you, you, you don't really hunt the people, but you go there to search their things to find out what they're doing there, and, like, one cauldron where you learn to override things, there was a, a bandit camp, and you had to go through the bandit camp, and then in the bandit camp, after you override the core to learn all the monsters, stalkers raided the base. So you had to go kill the stalkers. It's a really neat, neat game 
that era because it does all that stuff. Hmm. I hear CJ is a big fan of Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, my favorite game of all time would have to be My Name is Mayo. Because there's nothing better than dressing up a mayonnaise jar and then tapping it 10,000 times. No, no, no. Yours is Batman. <laughs> we all know that. No. My favorite game is Resident Evil 2. Batman. Amazing story. Amazing graphics. Held up and uh, since 1998, been one of the best games I've ever played and by far the game I've replayed the most. CJ, I hope that you enjoyed some Resident Daryl and the Illusor Trio. Wow. You don't even mention our usernames. Zado VP, a wonderful friend, a listener from Europe. He's a previous guest of the show. He's been with us since basically day one. He is the tech lackey of the Push to Plat Discord. He's eager, as always, to use that ban hammer, and he's just waiting the chance. It is, it's wonderful that you submitted your list here of your top five games of 2020, sir. I haven't read them yet, so we're going to do this together, listeners, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Of course, if you're looking for an episode with Zador VP, who joined us quite recently in episode 79, Games of a Generation, on the cusp of the next-gen launching systems, we talked all the games that we loved throughout the PS4 era. Zador, if I can take a moment, listeners. Well, look, of course I can. It's a podcast. I can take as many moments as I want, I suppose. But Zador is a wonderful asset to this community and more more so even to myself. He's introduced me to so many games, so many JRPGs in particular. And not only does he introduce them, he's, he's patient in providing information. Of course, one of the biggest games that, that he sort of, I suppose, pushed me into, if you like, was in January last year where I played Final Final Fantasy 12 and it was it was a wonderful experience it's a it's a big game probably not the first game you want to start with in a Final Fantasy series but because I'd started at 15 14 and worked my way down to 12 I think I appreciated it even more and I think it has gone on to be my favorite perhaps Final Fantasy game now in some ways I find it I find it even more complex than 14 the open world MMO and even just recently the other day back and forwarding a little bit on the Final Fantasy 7 remake a wonderful, a wonderful asset that I, I really do appreciate, sir. So his top five for 2020. He says here, only picked from games I actually started this year. We start here, and I don't know that these are ranked, so you know, look, they're all wonderful listeners. We start here with AI The Somnium Files, another great Kotaro Yuka Shi visual novel i prob i apologize for butchering the name there sir with an excellent twisty mystery and multiple paths to play through to finally reach that true ending this is another game that i found because of zador and i look i really enjoyed my time with it an escape game vn i've played many vns and you know some are some are better than others often one of the the biggest attractions in a vn is the flow chart is moving between the different divergent paths and and it's not always very great. And AI Somnium Files, it, it produces a flowchart that is so easy to follow that even if you aren't a VN sort of connoisseur, you know, you've, you've played tons of them, you're still going to still gonna find it easy to navigate between the, the, the two divergent story paths. And, I mean, many VNs give the illusion of having these different, you know, alternate endings, but they often funnel in to, you know, to, to really not that much difference. Perhaps a character or two dies here or there, so they're not there at the ending. This was a, a VN, if you like, that has a really distinct distinct sort of two, story, I suppose you could say, or two distinct stories, I should say. And one of the great things is your early choices will determine which way you go, but, you know, don't use a guide, just experience it. And then whichever ending you get, you can easily go back and get the other, but it's sort of, in a way, it tailors it so much to you because of that, that randomness in those opening early choices, I suppose. Sure, there may be moments of frustration in the collectibles, but they come under the, the escape game-isms, and with a guide can be very easy to clean up. It has a wonderful Japanese ending, some amazing Japanese humour, and look, I endorse that pick, so it's wonderful. Disaster Report for Summer Memories. 
a great continuation of the disaster report final escape raw danger zitai zushimi toshi franchise <laughs> you're really out for me today so it's just an excellent bundle of japanese silliness combined with some serious natural disasters it's another game that i found through zeta and played just a month or two ago and i picked it up ages ago and it it, it has if you do pick it up digitally uh, and it still has an option to to get the theme that comes with it it's a beautiful theme or whatever but it has has an absolutely gorgeous song that just plays on your, your PS4 desktop that alone is worth the price of admission into the game. I've had it on there all year and I, I really love it. Of course, the song is in the game, but to be able to hear it whenever you load in is, is something special. The game itself is off the wall. I'm sure it's not for everybody in any way. It's a walking sim with light puzzle elements. The trophy side of it, it's not too bad or whatever. You would want a guide because there's a few a few miscellaneous things that you need to do. And there are a few trigger points in the game. In particular, one point in a train station about midway through where I was completely lost at what to do. Of course, the premise of the game is that an earthquake has flattened the city in Japan here. And these, these people are just trying to survive survive it I suppose so this is the escape room element if you like or escape room city I suppose if you see it yes it's linear but it's it's telling stories that are that are emotionally quite deep but then just just flippant as well of course you know a a family struggled in this thing with their baby or whatever and then all of a sudden the, the whole tower just sinks under the water there's so much going on in this and then on the flip side some wonderfully crazy Japanese humor bee costumes and everything else the game accelerates to what I thought was quite a fair and and just ending and very much worthy of the 15 or so hours this game would require of your time. But of course, highly Japanese in nature. Sega Scarlet Grace Ambitions. I can only do these Sega games with plenty of time between each one. They just take so much effort, planning and multiple playthroughs to actually platinum. Or a mostly fun but buggy addition to the Sega, not Sega, Sega franchise. This may be one of the easier ones as plenty of things have changed from the usual formula. Some really interesting playable characters, including a mayor, a lighthouse keeper, and a churro vendor. And I know at the time he was playing this, it was a big thing that there was a lighthouse keeper, and I think there may have even been a trophy for that. I remember Zadol going through this game, and look, it's not not for me, it's probably not for you either, listeners. Well, maybe it's for Boston George. It's It's a massive grind of a game, or whatever else, and I know it took him many, many hundreds, I'm gonna say, of hours there. Congratulations on that, sir. And it's wonderful to see that it does make your your top list with so many hours invested next up i suppose no surprise if you know mr zador vp temtem the only game on the list that isn't japanese and that has no trophies at all right now an early access ps5 monster taming aka pokemon mmo game that includes optional crossplay with pc players and an optimal co-op option for the entire game it just sounds like it's a perfect game for me if they remove the pokemon zador it's the only thing It's got some good jokes and references in it, and so far the gameplay has been good for the entire co-op run with my brother, who is cross-playing via PC. I dropped in on a little bit of their stream the other day of this game, and it has some wonderful battle music. Look, I'm not across the Pokemon universe, as you know, listeners, but if this man, if he endorses it, and I believe he told me that he found it at that time even more enjoyable than some of the the Pokemon games that he'd played in the past, especially with the the co-op action so perhaps worth a look and of course trophy support i'm sure is coming for that game in 2021 his final one and look it's a beast it warms my heart sir because this is on my pile of shame if you like that i'm looking forward to getting into yakuza like a dragon a Dragon Quest inspired Yakuza game with fantastic turn based JRPG combat, a great cast of characters, and good English voice acting combined with crazy Japanese silliness. This game is just a perfect amount of crazy, from fighting enemies using various things as weapons, such as pigeons, landline telephones, thumbtacks, glow sticks, lanyards, etc., or summoning help from unlikely sources such as chickens, Korean soap stars, a Friday the 13th Jason homage, or a young girl with a donation box. And I believe there's also a lobster summons in that, a giant lobster. So it's wonderful to see you you playing this series. It's a 
It's a series listener that I've had almost no interaction with, although having the wonderful Platt Zach on the show in the past, he's, you know, a big fan of this series in particular. It did it did uh, pique my interest, and, and just last month I played, or earlier, this month I should say, I jumped in to Yakuza 6. I absolutely loved it. Sure, the Platt's going to be a massive grind or something, although I understand the easiest plot of the series, but the sort of 20 or so hours the story took me, it was wonderful. It was like a, a melodrama, if you like, and it could be played again in a way that the quests weren't gated. You could just move through the game naturally. Of course, that's playing on an easier difficulty, I suppose. It inspired me so much, Yakuza 6, that I, I went back to play Zero again, which I, I touched on, you know, years ago uh, when it had come out. And uh, while I really enjoy that game, the, the lack of of a save state in that you can't save whenever you want a manual save if you like is a, is a maybe a slight detraction from that but having played six it really does does push you back to to the, the beginning of the story i understand seven is completely freestanding but if you're if you're concerned about that obviously playing through zero through to seven is going to be or six is going to be a massive time commitment i understand you can jump into six and i would highly i'd highly recommend it because it ends dory and it just it just sort of of it's just beautiful uh, a beautiful Japanese-ness I suppose there's craziness you know adult babies all sorts of things idol culture in there as well but also a bit of rural Japanese culture against the the Tokyo and the the city there it's been a pleasure today, sir, to read through your top five games. All of these games I've played or I'm now even more eager to play. It's been wonderful to have you as a valuable asset to this community. I wish you all the best in 2021 and for more future episodes and lively, vivacious gaming conversation to continue. Thank you. Recently, I had the opportunity to appear as a guest on the 100th episode of the Platcast. It was particularly special for me because I listen to that podcast every week. They make me laugh and they educate me with their wonderful passion for PlayStation games and trophies. It's been a great honor in the last year to have both Platinum Zach, Platinum Zach's wife, and Chernobyl Ninja Dylan as guests on Push to Plat. And it's with joy that today I can bring you Dylan's favorite games of 2020. First off, I want to say thanks, CJ, for allowing me back on his program. It's always fun to be on Push to Plat. 2020, man, what a year! What a year! Between, you know, the, the coronavirus, presidential elections, rioting, protests, you know, it's just been a year. So, you know, I, like most of you, have probably gone to video games to give us a source of release. And, boy, I played a lot of video games this year. Uh, just looking at my list, it's, it's considerable what I've played this year. I started the year off playing One Piece World Seeker, and as of recording, it's the 27th of December, and I've just finished Gris. And there's probably 60, 70 games in between. Um, a lot of the games that I played this year were much older titles um, that I just hadn't gotten around to playing in the years before. A huge notable uh, example of that is Red Dead Redemption 2. Um, getting around to playing the Persona dancing games, which I've always wanted to do. Getting around to, to finishing Uncharted 4, not getting the Platinum, I still have to do that, but finishing it. Um, going back and finally finishing, um, getting the Platinum in Star Wars Force Awakens after a huge glitch and two years of not playing it. Going back and playing uh, Legends of Heroes Trails of Cold Steel 2. But... You know, those are old games that I played. This year has brought us a lot of good games and a lot of not-so-good games. So I want to start off with some of my, like, good games that I played this year. And a lot of these are going to have some recency bias because I recently played them. Like, I would say the biggest surprise to me being, a, like, a game that stood out above the rest because when it was announced last E3, I believe, it was written off as a Zelda clone, and or a Breath of the Wild clone. And that's, well, when it was called, then it was called Gods and Monsters. But now it's called Immortals Phoenix Rising. I actually really, really enjoyed this game. It was a definite sleeper hit for me. I was excited when I saw the trailer, 
and having played through it in like four days getting the platinum i definitely would recommend this game it's so much fun yeah there's a lot of samey stuff in it but the game continuously is fun from start to finish and that's definitely a highlight of the show it's the biggest surprise for me of the year being you know from like eh, lukewarm reception to or reception about the announcement to a lot of people really enjoying this game um, another game that I really, really enjoyed this year was Demon's Souls. Um, I pre-ordered my PS5 back in September. I got it on launch day. Um, I This was not the first game I played. The first game I played was Miles Morales, which also is a fantastic game, one of the best from this year. But I think Demon's Souls is the PS5 experience currently. It is the flagship title for the PS5, both graphically and gameplay-wise. It does a lot to push next gen. And it kind of is a system seller. It's such a good game to play on your PS5. Now, it is a Souls game, so it is insanely difficult. But this has such a low barrier of entry compared to, say, Dark Souls or Bloodborne or Neo Sekiro. It is much easier than those games. And the Platinum reflects that. It's sitting at almost 25% right now. It almost has 3,000 Platinum Achievers. It is not a hard Platinum. It is a hard game. Don't get me wrong. It is a hard game. It is difficult at times. But the Platinum experience is not much more difficult than the game itself. But it is still one of my favorite experiences of 2020. Um, a, a couple more. The biggest... I would say one of my top five games this year, I paid nothing for. It came out. Well, I mean, I paid five hundred dollars for the system it came on, but that's Astrobots, the Astro's Playroom. It comes free with your PS Five, and it is such a trip down, like, nostalgia way. That just playing through it brought tears to my eyes because I have been playing PlayStation since the PS One, and it was just like, oh, here's you dug up a little rock. Here's a uh, the PS One controller. Here's the Dual Shock with you know the thumbsticks. That game to me is it's not even it's not a tech demo it's not a game it is a celebration of sony as a product and for that alone i definitely recommend playing that i mean you're going to it's going to be on your ps5 um spider-man miles morales a really fun game i it is the same thing everyone's going to say about the spider-man game you know it makes you feel like spider-man if you liked marvel spider-man this is just that plus more with some additional like camouflage and venom powers and you're not playing as peter you're playing as miles who in my opinion is a much better character um you actually feel for miles um and so i mean i'm not saying you don't feel for peter but like miles like miles feels like he grows up in the city he feels like someone of the city peter feels like that in a way but not the same sense that miles does miles game is about a sense of community Peter's is a game about saving the world. But I, I do recommend playing both, especially for $40. It's a no-brainer if you have a PS5. Um, a, a couple games that I played this year that I thought were okay. Um, Resident Evil 3, um, which really sucks because after you know Resident Evil 2 was my game of the year last year, playing Resident Evil 3 kind of felt like a big letdown. Not because it's bad. The game is not bad. It's just really short. And, of course, the game encourages you to do multiple playthroughs. But if you're like me and don't feel like playing the game five or six or seven or eight times just to get the Platinum, unlocking the the hardest difficulty, which is, which is Inferno, but that's like... So you start with easy, normal, and hard. You unlock very hard. You unlock Nightmare, and then you unlock Inferno. It's just... Oh, it's a slog... It's a slow, short slog that, sure, like, if you if you love the game, you're going to love it. But if you're like me and we're kind of disappointed with the length of the game and, like, how different it feels from Resident Evil 2 and, like, just the way the game is. Like, it, once you learn how to play the game and run through it, it's just, it's no different each time. With, with Resident Evil 2, you had an A story and a B story. And two characters. So the game had some replay value. This, I guess, would have replay value. 
But it, to me, it was just a, not a disappointment, but like, yeah, I would say a disappointment. Just because it was it coming hot off the heels of two, it's just it's it was doomed to fail. Mar speaking of failure, Marvel's Avengers, what a huge, huge letdown this was. After being hyped up for so long, um, Square Enix really dropped the ball on this. The game is not good. Did not run well on my base PS uh, five or PS four. Sorry, it it just is not a good game. It's very boring. It's very samey. I beat the story and then I didn't want to touch it again. So I got. I mean, I, I don't have it anymore. And at sixty dollars, I felt like I was ripped off. So I would avoid Marvel Avengers. For now, maybe they can fix it later. Maybe you'll get Spider-Man, but I don't really think it's a good game. Fall Guys was one of my most anticipated games from the year. I really was looking forward to it, and it made me more mad than it should have. So I stopped playing it just because it made me mad. It made me way madder than a game where you play a jelly bean in an obstacle course should be. Um... I forgot to mention Bug Snacks. Bug Snacks is such a fun, interesting Pokemon Snap, collect them all, fun fest. I mean, if you have a PS5, it's free. It's free until, I think, January 25th or something like that. Uh, even if you don't, you have PlayStation Plus, claim it. So when you get a PS5, you can play it for free. It is such a fun time. I don't want to speak any more about it because I don't want to spoil any more of the game. But which brings us to... The big, big hits of the summer. Back-to-back -back total knockouts. Uh, first of Us... First of Us huh, is The Last of Us. Um, Last of Us Part 2. The more and more I think about this game, the more and more conflicted I get about the game, I really enjoyed the game. The story is hit or miss uh, for people. I personally don't like uh, how they handled the ending, but... Any scene with uh, Joel and Ellie, it just it it pulls your heartstrings. And for a game to do that and make me even like get goosebumps thinking about it now, just those scenes and I want to go back and just watch those scenes again. I think that's a, a, a it's a good game. It very much it deserves criticism. Every game deserves criticism. I think some of the criticism for this game is a little harsh, and I don't agree with. A lot of things the game did, but I also agree with a lot of things that it did. It did do. Um, that being said, you're gonna play the game if you have any interest in it. You, it's, it's probably like thirty bucks right now, easy. It's definitely it's worth your time to play just to have your own opinion on it, and you definitely need to play the first game to get any sort of enjoyment out of the game. The second huge knockout of the summer was Ghost of Tsushima. Now. I've talked about this on my podcast, uh, podcast that Ghost of Tsushima, I was not as excited for. I was still excited for it because it's Sucker Punch and I like their games. But I wasn't as excited for it because I was like, oh, well, this is, you know, Samurai game at the end of the game. It's going to come out right after The Last of Us. It's terrible timing. Little would I know that this would be my front runner for Game of the Year for a very, very long time. Well... It's, this is another game I'll talk about very shortly, where the front riders for game of the year. This game is beautiful. Now it's not photorealistic in the way that The Last of Us is, but it has so much style, and you get lost in the world. I did not want to put it down any second that I played it. There were multiple days where I was playing 12, 13 hours a day because I did not want to put it down. And if that's not a game of the year, I don't know what to tell you. Um, some like games that I was kind of eh about uh, Minecraft Dungeons was really fun with friends not so fun by yourself uh, Diablo clone I mean it's like baby's first Diablo it's fun it's fun with friends when the online works I haven't played it since July uh, since June so maybe the online is much better than it was then but it was very bad at in June so Doom Eternal I loved 2016's Doom uh, Doom Eternal I was super excited for and kind of let down with just how annoying the end of the game felt. It didn't feel like it was hard. It just felt like I had no uh, time to even breathe 
which is not a good thing. I I was playing on easy because I always play. If I don't have to play a game on hard, I play it on easy because I play games for fun, first and foremost. And Doom Eternal was not fun at the end of it. It was very annoying because even on easy, enemies were taking eight, ten. 13 shotgun blasts to kill and then they just kept coming and they never stopped and i would run out of ammo and then i had to melee kill one or chainsaw kill one to get a bunch of ammo back and it was just you know it just it did not feel fun to play so the other front runner of the year for me game of the year and it, i f- this is very biased because the original game of this was my game of the year of 2017 16 whenever it came out and that's persona 5 royal I did not think you could approve upon Persona 5. I thought it was a perfect game from start to finish, with some minor inconveniences. They have taken those inconveniences, pulled them out, and added new quality of life adjustments that make this the definitive way to play Persona 5. It is such an improvement with the tiniest, tiniest of details being improved that I wouldn't even thought of. A few of them, yes, I would have thought of, but a lot of them I didn't even think of that you could improve it this way. And adding a whole, like, so most games, when you take the story and you expand it for an extra chapter, they lose a lot of that charm or they lose a lot of what makes the game the game. Persona 5 did not. It is, is it weaker than the game? A little bit. Does it feel like it's tacked on? At times, yes. But the new, the new play, uh, the new character in your team the new dungeons the new personas the new the two new arcana it's it's a masterpiece in my opinion and this is going to be this and ghost of tsushima and demon souls are going to be very very hard for me to decide game of the year and i just i just love this game to death i always will it's it's, i mean i'm very biased because persona 5 is in my top five of all time and then Coming to the very first 2020 game that I played back in January of this year, which feels like a decade ago, was Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. Boy, oh boy. I love love DBZ. I love Dragon Ball. I love anime. I love manga. So when this came out, having not played a Dragon Ball game in a very, very, very long time, I was very impressed with this game. Now, is it going to be for everyone? No. Is it is for Dragon Ball fans? Have they played through the story like this before? Yes. Is it a bit? If you know the story of Dragon Ball Z, is it repetitive? Yes. Is the gameplay loop um, repetitive? Yes. I'm saying repetitive a lot because the game does get repetitive. But that being said, I had a lot of fun with it, and it felt really good to play certain battles with characters and to see Cyber Connect to do an amazing job with some of the visuals. Like, some of the cutscenes for the fights are jaw-dropping. And they rival the original and how I felt when I was a kid watching them. So for that alone, like, I would recommend this if you're a Dragon Ball fan. Now, is it going to be Game of the Year? No. No, 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 no. I even forgot that it came out this year. That's that's how bad it was. They're not bad. That's how long ago it was. There's a lot of games between then and now that I've played that aren't from 2020 that I'm going to mention just a few of the standouts. The Legends of Heroes Trials of Cold Steel 2. Phenomenal game. Fell in love with the series in the first game. Kept playing it in in the second game. I have the third one on the shelf. Going to start it soon. Love that game to death. Uh, Man Eater. (laughs) Man Eater is just a fun time. You play a shark and you eat people. Like What can you not love? Get it for cheap. Have a fun time. Don't play it on a base PS4 like I did. There's a lot of lag. Um, Jump Force, huge disappointment. was just very grindy. Uh, it's, the Platinum's 3.3% because for a reason. It's very, very grindy. Very, very grindy. Not worth it, in my opinion. So, I mean, but it's definitely... If you are a Shonen Jump fan, it is made for you. There are so many references to Shonen Jump in that, in that game that you were going to be... You're going to be hard-pressed for choice for Easter eggs that you don't like. Um, a fun little budget game that I found was Terminator Resistance. That game was fun. I got it for like 15 bucks. At 15 bucks, that is a very, very fun game. It is. It feels like Fallout Light 
and that's not a bad thing. I don't think. I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, I think it's it's a good time for like fifteen dollars. It is very very easy. I got the platinum in less than six hours. I I, mean, I definitely would recommend it if you like Terminator, if you like Fallout. Some of the things are silly. Some of the things are fun. There's a trophy for unlocking a door that goes nowhere. That's really funny. I, I enjoyed the game. Um, I think the last game I'm going to talk about that I played this year that's not from this year, 2020, was uh, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. You know, I'm conflicted with Star Wars. I like some Star Wars things. I dislike a lot of Star Wars. Um, playing as a Jedi with not really any attachment to the other Jedi in the series and not really attached to the Jedi way of not having emotions and doing things in a certain way. That's what I like about this game. Yeah, the force powers are fun. Throwing a lightsaber is fun. Killing stormtroopers with the lightsaber is fun. Blocking the the blasters is fun. Um, it is a very weird Souls-like game in the sense that like there's progression you only lose your like experience points and not like souls and currency. But I would definitely say if you're a Star Wars fan, play it. You're going to play it anyways. I, I This game came out like last year. You've already played it. If you're on the fence about it, I would wait until it's on sale. Maybe under 30 bucks to get it and then play. It's definitely worth that at least. And I think that's really going to wrap up 2020. It's been a hell of a year. I got five days left i don't know if i'm gonna really play anything else i'm gonna take uh, some time off maybe watch some movies hang out with some friends bring in the new year with some champagne and i really hope you guys kind of do the same i hope you guys you know i hope your community there cj has a, a swell new year's eve new year's day and let's bring in 2021 with a bang and hopefully 2020 goes out with a whimper cheers everybody time to talk the spam of the year look i'm a proud spammy myself as you know it's one of my favorite topics to talk on and it's been a it's been a travesty i suppose listeners that we haven't included spam of the week for so many months now but why not why not overdose on it and now with a few titles across the year but before we do we really have to have a look at this category of out there games of the year as i said these games that just make you think what the fuck is going on who is buying these games out there well who who apart from cj and maybe you after listening to this today as well these are gems on the store that i'm sure you've never seen and look i don't blame you for it at all there are a couple there are a couple across the year so let's dive in we're going to start in february with the release of the adventures of double o dilly Yes, look, I know you didn't see this in any IGN top 10 charts, I can tell you, this year. What the Adventures of Odili was, was the ultimate crash test dummy obstacle course game. It's a physics-based game with unbelievably janky controls. You, you could, I believe, play in two-player local co-op as well. I don't think there was any online co-op. It was a fiendishly difficult game as well, and I know that I, I think that it did have a plat recalling, but I don't think too many people got it. Look, it's hilarious to watch a video of this game, but actually playing the game is is something else and <laughs> probably worthy of a pass. Look, I wonder if it's even still on the store today. February also saw the classic The Unicorn Princess. We talked about this game this year, the wonderfully beautiful Unicorn Princess, where the strangest mechanic of the game was that you could only ride the unicorn in short, sort of almost like cutscene sections, if you like, little vignettes across the whole score story. You couldn't you couldn't ride the unicorn whenever you wanted, and even when you finished it, they still locked that unicorn behind uh well, it wasn't even a paywall. I mean you had to pay so much to get into that game. You would have been hoping, I think, there was more unicorn 
unicorn action than the the poor ordinary horse. And then the, probably one of the strangest games for me this year, and look, more power to it because I know there are people out there playing it. There's probably not many people, but there are people playing it and they're, they're very skilled. In fact, so much so that I see there's a second or a sequel to this game coming. Look, perhaps it was a victim of, of COVID this year. I don't know if this league got up and running or not. It's a, it's a very European thing, I think. And the game was called DCL The Game. If you haven't heard of it, it's a drone racer. In fact, it's the only endorsed professional drone racing game game it's actually it's actually a lot harder than you would think to to fly a drone in a simulator and uh, the point of this literally was I think that they were going to have online racing there were going to be leagues around the world perhaps even even races with the professional drone racers I'm not sure if all that happened because as I said it did release very early in the year so highly ambitious in that front but look it ran it ran quite well and you know all jokes aside it, it's a it's a full simulator so you really you do need to know what you're doing a very difficult plat for that reason alone. March saw three wonderful releases. Rainbows, Toilets and Unicorns, a vertical shoot 'em up Look, it's, it's just a crazy game, as the name implies. You've got all sorts of things going on there. You've got priests that are trying to whack you with their sticks. You've got flying, look, I don't know what they were, sort of bosses as well. You do obviously play as the unicorn, shooting your pellets out of your rainbow ass, all full of glitter. It's just, it's wonderful. Of course, as you'd expect with a ga- out there game of the year, the control incredibly janky if you breathed on them the left or the right stick it would go flying across the screen and as you love in a game with high jank it was a one hit one shot kill game but look some absurdities in that game all the way through and through Freedom Finger, which actually is a really good game. It did release uh, Glitched on the trophies, but I understand they have fixed that since then. It has some wonderful voice acting casting, including Nolan North. Of course, he's in everything anyway, but for an indie game, it's a bit of a pull for sure. All the voice acting is great. The humor is incredibly crude and off the wall. It is a side-scrolling shooter, and it's uh, level-based, and it's really fun and some fantastic music in it. It's probably one of my maybe hidden picks of the year in the sort of, I wouldn't call it spam but it's uh it's kind of tricky but it's definitely worth a look and then of course we gave this game plenty of love this month month <laughs> this year i should say releasing in march was the snaky bus what more can you snake a snake and a bus it's a it's a perfect combination April saw perhaps the most out there VR title for the year, Sharknado VR Eye of the Storm. Look, I haven't played this game yet. I understand it's a very short experience of around an hour or two, uh, only a couple of levels. But look, you know, someone has to play this game, I'm sure. I'm sure someone has. I couldn't think of anything better, a better way to use your, your VR than Sharknado in a bucket beside you. May saw the highly ambitious physics-based superhero X fighter. And if you ever thought there wasn't much production, values in your big triple A style fighters then think again because this game really showed just how difficult it is to get everything working together at its base, the physics are actually really interesting from a game design. There's a there's a, a mixture of different Japanese and, and martial art fighting styles as well as a Brazilian uh, fighting styles as well within the game. They all do feel different, but unfortunately the game doesn't really have much of a career mode. It becomes very repetitive and look, in the end, is quite an easy plat with just spamming the, the controls and picking a few costumes. June brings a disturbingly titled name, Finger on the Roof, Go Rooftop Runner, where you played literally as a finger on the roof, a side-scrolling a platformer, I suppose, where you collected the coins. It had a wonderful janky controls and an expert glitch mode that, uh, that allowed you to fly across the top of the screen if you're having fun. Overall, a fairly easy plat and some wonderful trophy description names well worth checking out. August brought us one of the one of the most amazing movie crossing games I've ever played, Fast and the Furious Crossroads, which just goes to show just because you have a successful movie franchise, there's no reason why you need to invest and in, in replicate that in the game. It's a it's a bit of a travesty of a game, really, this one. It, it's one of those games that is so bad that it is good. If if you like the franchise, there's some wonderful Vin Diesel moments there, including the ending and a wonderful bonnet slide that makes the whole whole sort of 
six hour experience worth it? It is an open world of sorts game, but you're, you're sort of linear in your path driving between the quests. There's some <laughs> random QTE events and an atrocious multiplayer system that requires 18 people spread across three teams of six to even start. There's no AI fillers. It was a highly ambitious game coming in with a full price uh, price tag, which I believe has been halved. But look, if you can pick it up for a few dollars and you're, you're not too interested in the plat, as I said, for that multiplayer grind, it's a, it's a great time if you like the jank. Have a few drinks beforehand. Theme Park Simulator, which was basically a grab on the wallet, and it's wonderful to see these games are still existing on the Sony store. They didn't bother to include a simulator or even a real theme park in this game. Well, that's a bit of a cheap shot, I suppose. You could ride on the rides, and that's all you needed to do. I think it was for five minutes each ride. I never managed to figure out the camera control, so I got stuck on the bottom of each of the rides. So perhaps a little bitter and jaded there, but look, for $15 US, perhaps there's a better way to spend your money. But look, if you're after that quick cheesy plot then this is the one for you and who knows in 2021 maybe theme park simulator will hit the appropriate price of one dollar we'll have to wait and see october brings us some japanese love with kukiyami considerate question now this is a really strange one i was i was put onto this by a few people actually and it's basically a consideration simulator if you like and you're like what the hell is that well that is the point of this category, a consideration simulator. It it figures out how considerate you are by getting you to ask a a series of of questions. I think there's about a hundred questions and each of them has like a little sort of a stick figure, minimalistic art sort of skit, if you like, and you watch what happens. It only takes a few seconds and you make a decision sort of like, would you stand on a train or would you sit here? Would you do this? Would you open the umbrella? Would you give it away? All these things. And it, it seems to put it into some sort of an algorithm that determines what type of a person you are, whether you're, you're considerate or not it's a it's an interesting experience it's only a hundred percent listed it does have a few variations in mode and trophy requirements but you know it's a bit of a it's a bit of a laugh one of the strangest horror games for me this year was Lust for Darkness. This game is, well, look, it's got BDSM. It's got sort of, it's got a little bit of everything. It's it's overtly sexual in its nature right from the beginning with the suggestive mannequins. And depending on how you play, you may make those mannequins more suggestive uh, than they were even perhaps intended in the game. It's, it's a wonderful, short, spammy plat as well. And it's just, again, highly janky. And, but I'm just... I'm just filled with awe that these games are making it across from the PC. And then I'm going to loop all these games in together. But the first one dropped in August. They are, of course, the My Universe series. It's a wonderful, wonderful series of kitsch sort of games. Yes, they're a little overpriced. For some reason, some have plats and some do not. We've had a teacher one. We've had a cooking one. There's a pet one. There's also the Fashion Boutique, which I believe was the first one to drop on the PlayStation. They all play very similar. Similarly, if you like mini games, you'll love them. If you just want to waste your time, you'll love them even more. And it's wonderful to see this studio pumping out so many of these generic titles each week for the second half of 2020. November throws us a speaking simulator. This is a very suggestive game if you watch the way the lips move. In fact, the way you can make the lips move. I haven't played this myself. I feel I would would be too distracted by what I could fit into the mouth and how far I could open it. But, you know, I have heard that it's it's kind of a challenging challenging simulator. And I know that uh, I'm Starling on You Bro has put up some video footage. Absurd, but wonderful that it made its way to the PS4. And December just brings us two entries, two late inclusions, if you like, but still of quality. The first being Rhythm of Gods. It masks as a spam game, but it has some difficulty. It's a side-scrolling rhythm game where you have to match your your button inputs to the beat, if you like, to, to jump over things and whack enemies and, and slide under things as well. Each level is only a few minutes. It's absolutely absurd. Sometimes the hit detection is a little bit out there. The music starts off heavily rock, but becomes sort of on a loop or whatever else but look it's worth a it's worth a look for a few dollars and the last one for this year really just dropping in the last week a wonderful physics based fighting game i suppose a street brawler if you like the drunken fist i'm still eagerly looking forward to playing this game not only do you have to take out many enemies with the fist for in what i think is a fairly short plot but you also have to urinate on them for the trophies i mean what more could you want <laughs> Thank you. 
So without further ado, it is time now for the Spam of the Year. I think we've drawn it out far enough. Of course, if you're an upstanding member of the trophy hunting community, there is nothing here for you. Feel free to skip this section. Check out the, the timestamps in the show notes if you if you so prefer. But look, if you like the dirty plat, you know, if you are a bit of a filthy vulture for the trophies, then perhaps this is something here for you. We'll start with just a very quick rundown of the month. Starting in January, these are are my top picks of absurdity in the spam genre. For January, we have Pixel Devil, Invert, Without Escape, Red Bow, Foxy Land 2, Lumini. Actually quite a nice flow uh, platformer style game. Shadow of the Ronin, Revenge to the Samurai. One of the masterpieces of 2020 from Gilbert D. Pontes. Milo's Quest and Music Racer. The game built for a turbo controller or infinite patience. February saw many great titles, including Read Remastered, don't forget to turn off the screen shake, Project Starship, Nerved by Playstick Interactive, a true experience of degenerate game making, Just a Phrase by Palki, 000, a wonderful one-bit platformer, Mosaic, Nighting Plus, Grizzland, Vasalis, its sole purpose to try and brick your Vita, but quite quite okay on the PS4, Stab, 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 a strange... Uh, two player if you like but it can be done with two controllers and one person party game and Bucket Night the game that rewards every level with the trophy because you deserve it March saw the VN start from Radalika with Syrup and the Ultimate Suite Breeders Homegrown Director's Cut that was a strange one Super Destronaut Land Wars the sequel to Super Destronaut Jump Step Step Chop Is Dish Thunderpaw, Red Death, Epic Word Search, Maze, exactly as it sounds, Dark Souls Plus, which was a wonderful, a wonderful rethinking of the duck and its, its ability to travel in multiple directions at high speeds, Dissection, which was a little bit too much for me, a horror spam s escape room game, Random Heroes Gold Edition, April brings us Rush Rover, Null Drifter, Blind Men, another wonderful Rattleacker VN port, Freak Out Calamity TV show, one of the less janky Jandusoft games coming in around three to four hours, a top down, well, a top down shooter, I suppose, with, uh, with a little bit of everything in there, maybe even a little puzzle solving on one of the levels. Well, that's a bit of a stretch. Guard Duty, the first, I, well, not the first point and click adventure that Rattleacker's ported, but perhaps the biggest and most substantial. If you're a fan of the old Sierra games, particularly King's Quest, you'll like this one. Jigsaw Abundance plays to at its best. Gun Crazy and Active Neurons, the puzzle game. Uh, high value game. And the first of two Active Neuron games in 2020. May saw Tamama Tamamari Tamamari Complete Edition, Read 2, Task Force Campos, Ion Fury, Crypto by Palki, Flux Terrier, another eye-opening event, Concept Destruction, the highly praised, almost game of the year, I believe, White Boys with Attitude, The Pursuit of Money, Rune Lord, known for its high glitches in the end, be careful of that one, and Many Faces. June saw a Strawberry Vinegar, another of the Radar VNs, Awesome P2, The Skilled Spammer, Tech Chico in the Castle of Lucio, Pity Pit, Fault Milestone 1, another skippable 100% VN with a really strange story. Radio Squid, hmm, this was a tough one. Coaster VR, no effort required. Star Wars Episode 1, Racer, no effort required with wonderful glitch found through the community. Taco Tan, look, you can play that game a hundred times. An octopus shooting in a side-scroller, what more could you possibly want? And of course, Summer with Shibu Inya, the personification of dogs in VNesque style. July sees Snakes and Ladders. It's another 100% Turbo Love Fest. Clash Force, Sushi Break, the beginning of the Sushi Break games. And we really should take a moment here for the spam community. It's wonderful to see these games coming out. Of course, they're a little pricey for what they are. And of course, all all the studio is doing is re, uh, reworking the game, I suppose, or, or re, re, uh, renaming the game, I should say. But look, you know, why not? And we've had so many of them this year. I'm sure many of you owe many a cheesy plat to them. Robozaro, Distraint 2. This was a decent one. 
in my mind from the Rattleike Report. Evan Daniels and friends, it's our forgivable and forgettable ultra hat dimension. We should talk. Well, yes, it did talk and talk and talk. Epic word search collection to Jazai, the first case HD, another VN port from Rattleika. Nicole, 100. Oh, this one wasn't bad either. 112th seed. It's a wonderful little puzzle game. Really doesn't need a guide. Quite straightforward and a nice, easy 30 minute plat. And of course, somewhat skilled Lost Wing. It'll either take you three or six minutes or the rest of your life if you're not good at these games. August sees a little of the skilled spam dropping on us with Rogue Cube. Memory Lane, another play stick matching game. Prehistoric Dude, Zero Strain, Rusty Gun, a wonderful little side scroller game. Big Dipper, another short skippable VN. Even the Ocean, a high value VN that most of the community skipped. Norman's Great Illusion, a somewhat strange driving mini game in an overall sort of industrial and oppressive story about how us little man don't matter. Road Bustle. It's the plat you probably have three times, even if you don't have three regional accounts. Well, you do now because of this game. Whether you ran into the wall or you did this game legit, hold that plat up high. That's what it's all about. Alpha Beset by Paugi. Sushi Break Head to Head. I suppose if there are going to be any of these that are challenging, it is the Sushi Break ones, but the Head to Head makes them a little easier. A Hero and a Garden. Room Mates. Well, this is a bit of a longer VN. Educational Game for Kids. A game where the kid will need an IQ through the roof, I'm told, to complete some of those map puzzles. September brings us Masks of Myth, Batu to Batu, an interesting, an interesting match game, I suppose. I'd never come across this game before. Uh, quite enjoyable. Case Animatronics, a horror walking sim. Golf Zero, The True, Active Neurons 2, the second of the puzzle games, and more involved, a wonderful effort. Timuku, a five minute plat. Donut Break, more sushi breaks. Jet Set Lights, uh, a little spammy, masked with a little skill finish. Birthday of Myth. Midnight, the final, a follow-up, I suppose, to the Midnight series. One of my favourite series of spam of all time. Swordbreaker, the game with millions of trophies. And Feather, a wonderful flying simulator that's well worth a look, even beyond the 15-minute plat time required. October saw Skate Master to Chico, Halloween Candy Break, Reflection of Mine, oh, that was a strange one too, Street Racer Underground, another Turbo Controller Fest, Brotherhood United, Doodle God Evolution, that's right, the Doodle Gods now have a platinum, A Tale of Paper, no, hold that one, Lord of the Click, yes please, The Language of Love, another short VN, Mum Hid My Game, now available on all region scores, I believe, kind of fun, kind of has a message at the end. Be careful of that one. An awed dot, perhaps one of Rattleika's jokes on us. It's a wonderful choose-your-own-adventure book with a, a trophy list that is, uh, well, it's not clear, I suppose, with all the RNG. November sees Hard Cube, Dark Source, which will take you all of 15 minutes. Paw Patrol, Mighty Pup, Save, Adventure Bay, eight levels of fun and an easy plat. Vera Blank, The Full Moon, The Perplexing Orb 2. Look, this is a lot more skilled than the first one, perhaps even more enjoyable. My Name is Mayo 2, needing no introduction. Hide and Dance, it's by the same studio that Mum hid my game. One of the trophies provides a little bit more of a challenge, but look, it's a nice little afternoon spender for Rhythm games. Mystopia, Snake Boat offer Otterific Arcade, a full five minutes of fun to be had. BFF or Die, a game that probably, well, a game that could have probably been quite tricky if you needed to complete more than the first 10 levels for the lovely plat. Donut Break Head to Head. Oh my goodness, there were a lot of these sushi games this year. December sees our final offerings of spam for the year with Poor Poor Poor. The Rattle Like a Game I have not yet touched, but I hear is quite good, if long. The Wonderful Chickens on the Road, the most apropos of all games named this year. Literally, Chickens on the Road. Halloween Candy Break, Head to Head. 
Autumn's Journey, IAI, My Hidden Things, a wonderful point and click spam game with, well, multiple point and clicking. It's almost more like a, a find the object, I suppose, style of game. Round out by Palgi. When the Past Was Around, another wonderful hidden object game that I really, I'm really enjoying with a beautiful music score. Kale's Treasure, the last of the Jandu Soft Jank on offer for this year and an easy plat. Catch, which look you could plat as a double stack and actually play the levels or skip them as, as you choose. And not to be outdone, Christmas Break, the final of the sushi breaks for the year. Nekopara Volume 4, finally localized to the west for another short skip. Dogfight 2020, a short vertical shoot 'em up, only 100%. And the final one for the year, Spirit Arena, a top down shooter, sort of a party game, I suppose, surviving the waves for around a three to four hour plat. Of course, there were so many more wonderful spam titles, but they're the ones that really stuck out at me this year. In a year where earning 500 plats was no more than an afternoon's work. Mr. Tam, a wonderful member of the Push to Plat community and listener from across the ditch, has submitted his, well, his top three games and then a, a collection, if you like, of, of smaller experiences. And I know that I know that he's a serious gamer. I've watched some of his streaming on Twitch. He plays he plays the big games, and I'm sure coming into this podcast and this community, his his eyebrows were somewhat raised at the number of short games that exist and that one person can literally basically play only those sort of games but it it warms my heart to know that we've perhaps expanded you know some of the indie games into your rotation as well so some of these shorter masterpieces as as we'll get into in your list here I can see that I can see that you're starting to find some of the real gems there he starts off here with a massive game Persona 5 Royale the original PS5 is the most stylish game I've ever seen and was my favorite JRPG of 2018 I've not gotten far enough to see all of the differences improvements, but so far it's been a delight to play. Playing Spot the Difference is pretty exciting too. And I think we just take a moment there, listeners. Obviously, this game is uh, it's hundreds of hours. I believe since uh, he wrote this, he has gone on to platinum the game and, and to finish it. But I think it was somewhere in north of 300 hours or 250 hours he put in. When I played this game, and I, I did most of the stuff, but you know, you know, in my my gaming style, it was still a good 120 or something hours for me as well. And that was with many of the side quests in the dungeon sort of left, you know, undone, I suppose. And to come back and in my mind the whole time was that the the persona 5 game while while amazing the trophy requirements were so uh, so difficult if you like you had to be so fastidious in your approach to it from the beginning you had to be using almost a daily guide and none of that interests me so when royal came out and it's so open in its trophy requirements you can just play the game sure there's one or two hard hard lock areas but but by and large it's it's really open and and you know you don't have to worry you can just play the game and it was was a perfect experience for me and I remember getting to where the end in Persona 5 would be and thinking wow this is a this was enough and then a whole another section opened up that new section which I'm sure I'm sure you'll agree sir it was was very well done and including the ending which of course we're not we're not going to spoil here but the other thing to consider is when you you play these long games, you almost these and particularly long JRPGs. But I'm sure it's the same in, in shooters like Fortnite and things like this. That when you do platinum them, and it doesn't matter whether they're difficult or not, when you've invested 100, 200, 300 plus hours, you, you almost feel like you just want to you want to play it again for some reason. I think I think there's a lot in the you know that you're you're strong in the world. You know how the mechanics work. You want to push different boundaries. You want to try different elements or whatever and the the attraction of getting more trophies i suppose while you do it is is always huge but to to play a game like persona 5 and then to turn around and still want you know still have such a strong desire for royale i think is is wonderful it's a i mean we've heard time and time again about the style in the game the music in the game is fantastic but i mean the subject matter as well even you know in the first dungeon or whatever the with the coach and the the sexual abuse of the students or whatever which is you know what's going on there it's it's 
it's not afraid to touch the issues. And, you know, we've, we've said here before, these Japanese games, if you, if you don't play them, you know, and if you can handle a bit of Sword Boy action in your games, then play them. Because I think the more Western games you play, you eventually, you reach a point where you just, you want more depth or whatever. And while it's awesome to always have these 20 and 30 hour experiences that are, you know, they're tailored for our lives as well. You know, it's, it's, it's an amount that we can get through in a reasonable time. Sometimes just having this massive project you're working on for a year or two years and, and just chipping away at it, it it's so immersive, far more immersive than you're ever going to find in your, your sort of linear style games at the 20 to 30 hour Mark. Golf with friends is his next pick. With working from home, the gamers at work got lonely and we decided to do a daily lunchtime golf. We played on Steam and included some two to three hour after work on Friday play sessions. That's been some of my best multiplayer gaming experiences in a while. It caught me by surprise when it dropped on PS4, but it turned out to be one of the firstest platinum. There you go, sir. Well, there you go. Isn't that funny? Because I didn't know that was an even a game until it dropped on PS4, and I had to, I had to get it day one. I love, I love my golf. I love my mini golf, and of course now it is on the Xbox. I believe on the the Game Pass as well. So there's so many. I believe on the Switch too, and obviously on the PC. So many opportunities to play it. It's not, it's not a pushover game by any stretch. Those courses, they're tough, and of course going for the platinum, very, very tough. I'm sure you could cheese it with some videos or whatever, but, but there's. There's a, there's a lot of skill in this game required, but then there's also so many add-ons or mods, I suppose, if you like, that are included in the game on the console version that you can put on where you turn it into goals or basketball hoops or blockers, a goalie, I believe, as well. So there's a lot of there's a lot of fun to be had in this game. And it's funny because I don't play a lot of multiplayer games. In fact, well, I don't play really any, I suppose, with perhaps the exception of a little bit of Resident Evil Resistance earlier this year with the Resident Daryl and Levi and I do I do really like playing them I think it's just the the time constraints obviously is so difficult so a shorter experience like a mini golf round that you can jump into it, it seems like a fantastic thing you've discovered sir so you're inspiring me to go back to that game now and to to check that out who knows I might see you around the greens one day his next game, and look, it warms my heart to see it on here. It's a game that the funniest thing about this game was that I was recommending it to people before I'd even played it. I heard that it was that good, and I, I wasn't disappointed. It's perhaps, I mean, it's it's hard to say what your favorite game of all time is because we're, we're all so nostalgic for old games. I mean, one of the earliest gaming memories I have was this old Taipan game or the old PC. And yes, it's just a text-based game and it was janky as... And I don't, Sometimes it would crash the PC when we were kids. Sometimes it wouldn't. And we ended up losing it, you know, at one point forever. I think it just died with the PC. But in my mind, that is perhaps my favorite game of all time. Or another one at that time, we played the Captain Comic, just because we played with local kids from up the street. And while those games probably don't hold up in any way, it's the it's the experiences around those games that make them so nostalgic. Thinking of Baldur's Gate 2 or having, having that pack, I think it was six. CDs and you had to keep feeding the CDs into the machine and you know you'd walk from one screen and then if you walk back into town you'd have to flip the CD and you'd have to consider was it really worth the five minutes of loading time and the flip CD to even do it you know things that the gamers today wouldn't even consider you know as you wait for your five seconds for your PS5 to load or something but it's it's amazing how far we've come but My point being that a lot of these games are so fond in my memory because of what was happening in my life at the time or the people around me, perhaps more than the actual games themselves. And so something like Nier Automata, his his third recommended game, for me, when I played this, there wasn't anything exceptional going on in my life. It was a January, a holiday period. It was boring, if anything. And so... It was the game in this situation. And there's, there's been other games, but but perhaps not to this clarity at this time in, for me and, and this obvious of, of just how much it was the game more than the events and nostalgia around what was going on. He says here, this was my first foray into streaming and what a delightful game to do it with. The game was weird and wonderful and the music was astounding. 
Sure, it may not be for everybody, but at least play the first two hours for anybody because it's a combination of every possible gaming style. You've got shoot 'em up, you've got vertical runner, you've got side scroller, you've got well, open world, you've got top down, you've got a bit of isometric in there as well. You've got a bit of everything going on or whatever. There's visual novel elements throughout this almost choose your own adventure. There's divergent story paths, there's multiple playthroughs with differences with characters, there's amazing music, there's ridiculous ridiculous side quest look there's even a trophy shop if you don't want to do all that you can buy the platinum with in-game currency and save manipulation states but it's it's something special and the the bosses in that game as well if you haven't played it they're just there's just moments where you almost want to put the controller down mid boss fight i know mr tam you didn't use the trophy shop you actually ground through all those requirements and those side quests i know there's also a lot of hidden content in that game that's not necessary for the trophy list and while I never touched most of that I I can only imagine how good it would be and of course that ridiculously long uh, DLC that dropped again without any you know in-game achievements I suppose uh, or virtual bling but you know the enjoyment of the game and it's something to look forward to in the the next installment of this game dropping I believe in March or April not not too far away at all. He then drops on a couple of short experiences, Rhyme, Abzu, Fae, Air, and Little Nightmares. He says, I haven't played many of these shorter experiences, and they were all very delightful. I did them all guide-free first run, and I'm really glad I did. Solving some of the puzzles was a bit tricky at times, though. And as we said earlier, these short indie games, they're they're highly worthy of your time. There's so many wonderful experiences. And I think a lot of it is tied up in the fact that they don't have, you know, these bloated 20, 30, hundreds of hour campaigns. The story is succinct. It can often be done in one or two sittings. Often the gameplay doesn't doesn't interfere with the, the narration in many of these games or with the puzzles because just by the nature of the length of the game, it doesn't become too involved. I'd highly highly recommend any of Rhyme, Abzu, Fey Air or Little Nightmares as well. It's been wonderful today, Mr. Tam, to read and share your games with the community. It sounds like you've had a lot of fun this year, both through your gaming, streaming, and the communities. Also, congratulations on completing the Push to Plat event. Your hoodie, jersey, shirt type thing is here now, and I'm looking forward to sending that out to you in early January when things improve in our our current lockdown situation. It's been wonderful to have you as a member of this community, and I thank you for writing in today. sharing your games with us i wish you all the best in 2021 many thanks i'm starling on your bro needs no introduction to the community a valued member across many forum sites his sense of humor combined with his quick wit his intelligence and his his natural ability to rhyme i suppose has inspired and made many many gamers laugh his wonderful trophy guides in the past while yes approaching epic odyssey length uh in in nature are, are something to behold i suppose and we've had him as a previous guest he was in fact on the recent episode 78 entitled i'm styling on your bro It was a wonderful conversation where we talked about, well, a lot about simulation games. He does label himself the Sim King, and look, rightly so. He'll go, he'll go pretty much anywhere uh, with some of these games. He's played your Iron Bread, but look, he's also played things like Assetto Corsa. He's a he's a skilled gamer through and through. And I know that recently, having finished the Speaking Simulator, for many of us, these games would look like absolute torture, but he finds such value and enjoyment in it that's inspiring. It's inspiring for me, and I do appreciate, sir, that you've opened my eyes to a whole lot of new games. Of course, in that episode, we also touched on accessibility in games. It's a topic that has reached more and more prominence in the last few months, particularly across many of the AAA games like The Last of Us 2, Watch Dogs, Assassin's Creed, Valhalla. It's a it's an issue that affects many gamers and it's wonderful to see that it's now being taken seriously to further expand the enjoyment of all gamers across all systems. I'm Starling on Your Bro submits 
three games for his favourites of 2020. And he's put here, to avoid accusations of bias and high predictability, I can't put the WWA, the pursuit of money, on the list. Just before we jump into to his games this week, listeners, obviously this appears to be a one-man show with guests, but look, no, no show like this or any show I think is really just one person. It's a collection of people that support everybody through reaching out to guests, to finding guests, to to breaking the ice as well, and to providing background information. And this year, I'm styling on you, bro, has has been a wonderful asset to both the community and this show. He's he suggested many guests. He's done the legwork on many guests as well to bring them on. And of course, one of them being the white boys with attitude. It was wonderful. I read a I read a Push Square article written about or published about two or three days before I, I had the chance to speak to them. And it was so evident to me that the article had never even bothered to contact them for any comments for any anything at all it was just just a piece i suppose a clickbait piece for that that site or whatever else and it it struck me that you know many many gamers as we've seen this year they're approachable they they want to talk and it was it was such a wonderful opportunity which i would never have come across naturally without i'm styling on your bro to talk and laugh with that wwa episode and their pursuit of money game or experience if you like so I'm styling on you here. His, we'll start, I believe he's ranked these. So we'll start from number three. Number three is pain, P-A-I-N. Love sexual references and janky physics-based games. This ticks both boxes. So this is a game, unsurprisingly, listeners, I'd never heard about till styling bought it up or whatever else. It is a PS3 game. It's Look, I think it's going to be as hard as balls, this game. It is just insane. He has a little bit of footage up on his YouTube channel. This ragdoll physics or whatever else, it just blows my mind. It's like coming home on a Saturday night, I suppose, and trying to get your body through the front door. But this is a whole game based on that and the skill that it takes. <laughs> Obviously, the character, I'm sure, is not, is not under the... Uh, under the influence, but well, perhaps perhaps the operator should be. His second favourite game, Strange Brigade. Amazingly cheesy third-person horde shooter. I had a permanent British accent and a cracking cheesy puns non-stop like the narrator. Probably annoyed the fuck out of Mindy on it. <laughs> So look, that's wonderful, isn't it? And it's, you know, it's supposed to be that, you know, class A British accent, isn't it? So it's just, it's a wonderful experience. I believe it's much better in multiplayer. I know that I had the opportunity with uh, Chernobyl Ninja, one of his friends, Zador VP and myself. Well, look, I was just the, the dog's body to be shot at, I believe, to help them knock out the multiplayer. A lot of fun. And I know it's quite a, a serious game playing that on difficult level. And a few, a few DLCs as well. It's not the first first person to endorse that game and it's highly worth a look his number one game for 2020 is neo awesome souls like with loot got carried through and hated the first 70 hours i then decided to learn it on my own and the final 100 hours was a blast i didn't want it to end Look, there you go. So I've heard, I've heard from uh, from Nurse, uh, feel good that this is a it's a serious game or whatever else. And look, it's too tough for me. I did play the opening section. I got up to that very first tower. And five minutes into the game with that guy, he proceeded to chop my head off numerous times, and I, I decided it was time to lay the controller down to someone like the Sim King and let them proceed. It's wonderful to hear that you were carried, but then that you you went back and you you sorted it out. It seems like you've had a wonderful year of gaming. So I want to thank you so much for all your help personally this year in putting the guests and the show together. You're a wonderful asset to the community. You're highly valued, highly requested, and I enjoy your sense of humour. You're one of the few people that can regularly make me laugh. Thank you, sir, and have a wonderful 2021.
Well, here we go, listeners, for the last time in 2020. Let's jump into the Push to Plat Platinum Club shout outs. And if you don't know how to get a shout out by now, well, that's on you. We have plenty to get through this week with these wonderful hunters. Let's start with Redbeard Rick throwing some love, all green love, on the Xbox here. 1250 gamer score, The Elder Scrolls for Oblivion. One of the best games ever made and holds up really well considering it's nearly 15 years old. It also drops a thousand gamer score on us with Doom 64. Best Trophy Hunter Ever, CSO, number 568, Life is Strange 2, and number 570, Ice Age 3, Dawn of the Dinosaurs. Oh, look, a pine code. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? So, look, I enjoyed that game a lot. I don't know if you plan on doing Ice Age 4 at some stage. It's a bit more monotonous <laughs> than 3 was. But, look, yeah, it's still it's still high value, I agree. Dino Roar, number 1370, Bug Snacks. This was a really fun game to play and it advanced at a nice steady pace. Nothing hard at all in the game, but it does keep you involved in the story throughout. Highly recommended for all ages. There probably isn't too many people now in the world that have the PS5, the elusive PS5, that does not have this Bug Snacks plat. It's a wonderful thing to see, a real welcome to the PS5. Boston George, number 196, Nexamon Extinction, had a lot of fun with this one. Pokemon clone with a Pacific Rim storyline. Lots of fourth wall breaks and satire. Story was pretty good too. Grind to catch them all was a little rough but doable. Highly recommended. I hear nothing but good things about this Pokemon-esque clone, George. It's wonderful to see you enjoyed it as well. Oh my goodness, the man of the hour, I'm styling on your bro, and it literally may take an hour to read this wonderful, wonderful uh, platinum descriptions he has for us this week, starting with number 235, Just Cause Floors 4. <laughs> if you'd be so kind as to just pause, it's time to take a look at this most abhorrent, demonstrably dog shite, digital dumpster fire this this generation. I've never seen a developer do so much with so little. Sadly, this is the furthest thing from a compliment in this case. This game has 438 stunts that were so trivial and repetitive, I thought it may just cause me to turn the game off and go hang out with my old trusty. The DLC also consisted of even more repetitive trash with even less assets to spice it up. I honestly think whoever led the game design on Just Cause 4 is, was, born of unconventional means. For this shout out's sake, let's call the lead designer Rico? When Rico's parents were going at it, I think his inept father accidentally pulled out and blew his load onto the crystal meth pipe. It's wonderful, sir. Anything goes here in the Push to Black Platinum shoutouts. This is why we never pre-read any of this. They then let the pipe to smoke, which caused a molecular chain reaction to heat the sperm, incubating and fertilizing it. The resulting genetic monstrosity would then go on to make Just Cause 4. It is a miracle this insanely boring game was done. I suppose I can take solace in the fact it's over. Push to Plat does not offer any medical advice endorsed by Push to Plat. Number 236, Speaking Simulator. Never have I ever felt so welcome in a simulation as when I jovially greeted by the AI robot in the main menu. This was a wonderful touch, a truly tasteful game indeed. Our task is to infiltrate the very essence of humanity and take over the world for a robot revolution. We are put into many difficult situations and must fluently speak our way out of trouble so as not to alert humans to the evil plan. This simulation has perfectly wonky controls I could only dream of, much in the same vein as Manuel Samuel. I enjoyed learning how to be a smooth talker with the ladies whilst going on dates with Karen, who I'm certainly care an awful lot about, who I certainly Karen, a lot of awful about. I will no doubt complete my New Year's Eve goal of doing a one night stand when I ask a fox if she wants it and any mechanical maintenance fluid. The writing in this simulation was brilliant and had me laughing a fair few times. I look forward to the robot takeover and having a new job to be biofuel. <laughs> <laughs> 
for the machines. I accept this because humans will never be as efficient. Anyone who doesn't have this on their list is a fox hunter. Take offence, speak now, or forever hold your peace. It's a logistical nightmare. Logistic wool nightmares. <laughs> trying to trying to read through it. And I love it. I love it. Congratulations uh, to you. I tip my hat. And of course, we were lucky today to have a Just Cause 4 inspired soundtrack that was underneath, the music underneath. I'm styling on you, bro favourite games segment earlier in the episode. Gaz Davis, number 73, Concept Destruction. Not much to say, really. And look, you've said it all, sir. EDJ 3DG Diego, number 66, Uncharted The Lost Legacy, number 67, GTA San Andreas, and number 68, Bioshock Remastered. All high-skilled games, sir, and therefore I bear them no time at all. But look, I bet you spend hundreds of hours on them, so congratulations. I tip my hat to you. It's a wonderful haul to finish off 2020. Mr. Tam, number 100, Persona 5 Royale. I took my time and really enjoyed it. I started near launch back in April, burned out by playing like 150 hours in two weeks and came back recently for a milestone. Clocked in a whopping whopping, sir, 349 hours and 29 minutes and enjoyed it a lot. It's like double, more than double my play length in that. So you really, you really irked out all the Japanese-ness, all the style that oozed out of it for you. That's that's wonderful. What a massive plat and I'm sure you're eager to stack that on the NA version soon. He also drops in late edition number 101 until dawn. It's a lovely, a lovely game there. So congratulations. Vigilant Pro number 43, City Skylines. More or less a Sim City clone. The driver AI is pretty realistic though, with nobody understanding how to properly change lanes. Fun overall though. Congratulations, sir. This game has scared me for an eternity. It's also a game, I know it has a ton of DLC. It has all these mare packs. You don't know what to buy. It's, oh, it's it's so it's so difficult to know. Look, I haven't even started it. You'd think that would be my primary concern at this point before the packs. But I hear that it's a wonderful game. The, the guide sort of scares me a little bit. Uh, it doesn't surprise me that you did that, being a high-skilled gamer. Congratulations. MZ Nitro, number 24, The Wolf Among Us. Pleasantly surprised by this game as I had no idea what it would entail, but really happy with completing it. Well done, sir. Zoot J, number 56, Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor, Game of the Year edition. Congratulations, sir. That's a big one as well. Ed the Shed 2014 drops in number 152 to 154. More Dark, the NAEU and AS stacks. It's a wonderful short 30 minute plat. And number 155 to 157, Autumn's Journey, NAEU and AS Stacks. Congratulations, sir. It's a wonderfully skippable VN. Not to imply that you did that, of course. But what was the story about? Hmm, I see. So our final, our final hunter for the year for 2020. It's crazy, isn't it? The final one, Teresa, will wrap us out. Number 775 with God Awful. <laughs> the Godfall PS5 <laughs> exclusive launch title. And by the sound of it, uh, Teresa, and from what I've heard, that title can live firmly on the PS5 and PC. Watch Dogs Legion PS4 and PS5 stack. Congratulations. I'm pretty sure that is not an auto pop in any way. So that's a good 60 plus hours to get those both. And it means that you would have had to have done the drinking in every bar and darts in every bar twice. Well, at least twice. I've heard it's glitchy. Congratulations. And to wrap us out, it seems fitting the final game to be shout out for 2020 Bug Snacks PS5. Listeners, it's been an epic journey today. It's a massive episode. It is a complete and comprehensive roundup from Push to Plat for the year that was 2020. Perhaps not the year that we wanted, but the year that we got. There was so much gaming to be had. There was so much isolation that inspired, I suppose, our gaming as well. Let us all hope that 2021 offers so much more promise for us, not only in amazing games, but in all our lives, in all facets of it. It has been a true privilege to speak with you each week 
this year. While we've undergone changes since our start, we are continuing to grow stronger. I am having a lot of fun. I hope you are as well. If you're a member of this community, then come and say hi through January. Even though we're going quiet now for a few weeks, we will be back towards the end of the January with all the regular shows and content again. I look forward to speaking to so many new wonderful guests and so many of you returning guests that have graced us as well. It's been a privilege It's been fun and I have laughed so much. I hope you have as well at some points. I look forward to speaking with you again in 2021. Be well, smile, be safe, have fun. Because why the hell not? See ya in 2021. Push to Plat podcasts are conceived, written and edited by CJ Anderson in Adobe Audition. YouTube upload handled by Repurpose IO. Music licensing by Artist IO. Push to Plat would like to thank all our Patreon supporters with special mention to our Patreon producers Zador VP, Redbeard Rick, Ready to Ebeg, MZ Nitro and Diego. Without your support, this show would cease to exist. If you would like to say hi, jump into the Discord in the show notes or on Twitter, the Push to Plat. If you are interested in supporting the show, then jump on Patreon, the Push to Plat Patreon, where you can find more information on how to support us and to allow us to continue to bring wonderful guests and topics from around the world.